morning, everyone. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few items. Uh, first, I just want to review the board meeting today. It's an all-day board meeting. We're going to start here this morning with the ACO budget team and have an ACO budget discussion and some recommendations on the budget. We'll go until noon. We're scheduled till noon. Then we're going to recess for lunch. And then at 1 o'clock today, we'll come back to this room. We're going to hear from the Vermont Department of Health on the state health improvement plan or the ship so we'll have dr levine from uh, vdh and heidi klein presenting that plan to you today and then after that we'll adjourn uh, the schedule for the rest of the month i'd like to review with folks because we have some um, off cycle meetings so next monday we will be back in this room uh, to um, hear from the ACO budget team again, and we have a potential vote scheduled. And then on Wednesday, December 19th, we have a regularly scheduled board meeting starting at 1 p.m. And that meeting will hear from our partners at DIVA on the Health Information Exchange Consent Policy Report. And then also uh, the ACO budget folks again will be talking with us about ACO certification, eligi 2019 eligibility verification and new criteria. I also wanted to announce that the ACO budget uh, public comment has been extended to this Friday, December 14th. So close of business Friday, December 14th is the extension. Folks can comment either by phone, by snail mail, or by our portal on our website. And uh, just a reminder for folks in this room to sign in as you enter. So we like to keep a, a record of who is attending our meetings. And that is all I have to report. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Susan. Okay, thank you. The next yes. item are the minutes of Wednesday, November 28th. Is there a motion? So, second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, November 28th. Without any additions, deletions, or corrections, any discussion? If not all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So at this point, we'll welcome the team to come down to the front for the ACO budget discussion. For the record, my name is Michael Barber, Chief of Health Policy here at the board. Just wanted to briefly introduce the other presenters. We have Kelly Thoreau, uh, Healthcare Financial Systems Analyst for the board, Melissa Miles, uh, the board's Healthcare uh, Policy Project Director, Sarah Lindbergh, um, self described data geek and head of the analytic analytics unit at the board. Um, on the phone, I hope we have uh, Jackie Lee from Lewis and Ellis. Good morning, I am here. Cool. Uh, I also wanted to just quickly recognize the other um, team members who've put in a tremendous amount of work reviewing this budget. Um, so uh, uh, Marissa Melamed on the policy team, Michelle Degree, and Robert Starwalt. Um, we have two topics we want to talk with you about. Um, the 2019 Vermont Medicare ACO Initiative benchmark for One Care Vermont and then One Care Vermont's uh, 2019 budget and payer programs. <clears throat> um, instead of addressing those two topics separately, we thought it would make the most sense to talk about them in context. So we're going to start off by talking about the 2019 um, programs between One Care and payers. Uh, 
Then we're going to talk about the rates of growth for those programs, which will include a lot of background on uh, the growth targets in the all-payer ACO model agreement. And also we're going to cover the 2019 Medicare benchmark recommendations uh, in that subject. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk about risk, uh, both at the ACO and hospital levels, followed by a discussion uh, about the ACO budget uh, and administrative expenses, and then One Care's 2019 programs and investments, and then finally we're going to wrap up briefly with um, the next steps in this process. And I guess before I jump into this, we were thinking it might make sense to hold questions until the end. Is that okay? Okay. So this slide is showing you the uh, payer programs that we think will be in effect in 2019. Um, the Medicare program, uh, as you can see, will be changing from the Vermont Modified Next Generation program to the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative. Um, under the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative, the Green Mountain Care Board not only sets the, uh, the benchmark trend rates for the ACO, subject to CMS approval, but also has the ability to work with CMMI on changes to the program design. So under that authority, you know, we've worked with CMMI to develop the program's quality measures and the, the kind of quality withhold arrangement that you approved a few weeks ago. Um, for Medicaid, uh, 2019 will be year three of the, the Medicaid Next Generation program. Um, for the commercial programs, the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP Next Generation program uh, would be moving into year two. The uh, self-funded pilot uh, with the University of Vermont Medical Center um, that was piloted in 2018 uh, would be uh, continuing. Um, expanding to additional self-funded um, health plans and progressing from shared savings to shared risk, which I'll get into in a couple slides. And then uh, there's a potential for a, a new uh, TPA level self-funded program coming online sometime in 2019. <clears throat> so the all-payer ACO model agreement has two requirements that relate to program design. Uh, the first the first requirement is that only people who are attributed under a scale target ACO initiative count towards our scale targets. Um, and a program has to satisfy four requirements in order to qualify as a ACO, a scale target ACO initiative. Uh, and they're listed up here. First, there must be a, a possibility of shared savings for achieving goals related to quality of care or utilization. Second, the ACO's shared savings as a percentage of its expenditures less than the benchmark is at least 30%. And the ACO doesn't have to be at risk financially, but if it is uh, a, risk, a risk arrangement, then the shared losses also have to be at least 30%. Um, Number three, services comparable to but not limited to all payer financial target services uh, have to be included in determining the ACO's shared savings or shared losses. And um, finally, uh, the ACO benchmark shared savings, shared losses, or some combination must be tied to the quality of care that the ACO delivers, the health of its aligned beneficiaries, or both. So this slide is just showing how the existing um, ACO programs may be changing as we move into 2019 and how these potential changes uh, relate to the four, four requirements I just went over. Um, the takeaway here at the top is that we don't think that the changes that OneCare has discussed in their budget submission would result in a program uh, ceasing to be qualifying as a scale target ACO initiative. Uh, in general, with the exception of uh, the p potential removal of non-specialty pharmacy from the Blue Cross program, um, these changes represent increasing accountability for cost and quality at the, at the ACO. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for Medicare, you can see there the um, 
One Care stated in their budget submission that they anticipate um, moving from an 80% uh, gain loss share to 100%, uh, which is where it currently is at in the Medicaid program. Um, as, as you guys approved a couple weeks ago, uh, there will be a, a kind of quality withhold framework in place for the Medicare program in 2019 that's aligned with uh, other payers. For Medicaid in 2019, um, there is going to be an increase, uh, anticipated increase to the value-based incentive fund withhold um, percentage and uh, a shift in the, the, the risk corridor from 3% to 4%. Uh, with the Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP program, uh, a potential change is um, uh, that there may not be responsibility for non-specialty pharmacy, um, which is not an all-payer financial target service, so that shouldn't be an issue in terms of um, whether it qualifies as a scale target initiative. And then on the self-funded um, pilot that's uh, kind of expanding, um, like I mentioned, it's moving from uh, shared savings to shared risk with a 6% corridor and a 30% share, that 30% share, uh, meaning that it would continue to be eligible as a scale target initiative. And then the, the new <clears throat> self-funded uh, program that may come online in 19 is just too early to know much about it at this point. So um, I would, uh, you know, accept that one care has stated it intends to develop a, a qualifying program there. And then the other requirement in the all-payer ACO model agreement that relates to program design has to do with alignment. So the um, ACO programs offered by Medicaid commercial insurers and self-funded insurers have to reasonably align in the uh, key areas of attribution methodologies, quality measures, payment mechanisms, and services included in the determination of shared savings or losses. Um, there doesn't have to be complete alignment, uh, but if there are differences, uh, we will have to justify those differences to CMS, and if we can't, um, come up with a, a plan for how to bridge those differences. And this slide is just trying to briefly set out how the existing programs may be changing in these key areas. Um, first, for the Medicaid program, there are some potential changes to the attribution methodology that will be used. Um, this may create a lack of alignment, but I think it's going to be fairly easy to justify those um, to CMS because the changes are aimed at increasing scale and um, there just there has to be space uh, for program innovation to achieve the goals of the model. So I don't, I don't see that as any sort of issue that we should be concerned about. Um, <clears throat> for quality measures, uh, as you guys are well aware, there will be some, some changes to the Medicare measures, which we've talked with you about um, a number of times, and those are uh, increasing alignment uh, of quality measures between programs. <clears throat> there are no changes expected uh, in terms of payment mechanisms, which means there will be some misalignment um, in the sense that public payers are currently the only ones offering the all-inclusive population-based payment mechanism. Um, so we're probably going to have to work with CMS and OneCare to better understand the issues around the, the hurdles in, in implementing such a payment mechanism. Um, and that just is what it is. We can't, you know, make them be able to, to pay that um, that way. Um, in terms of risk arrangements, uh, all the, the risk arrangements that are described in One Care's budget are symmetrical shared risk arrangements where um, it's the same on the upside as it is on, on the downside. Um, the levels are, are different between the programs, but they're coming, they're getting closer, essentially, you know. Um, the Medicaid corridor is, uh, looks like it's going to move from 3 to 4 percent. The, the sharing percentage in Medicare is moving from 80 to 100, which, like I said, is where it's at. 
um, on the Medicaid side. And then uh, the final subject, the final area, services included for determining shared savings or losses. There's, like I mentioned before, the potential loss of non-specialty pharmacy in the, the Blue Cross Next Gen program. Um, in terms of alignment, it's not an issue. Um, it's not currently in any of the other programs. Um, so. <clears throat> So uh, the staff recommendations um, for conditions around payer programs is really around reporting. So we want to know, we want to get a report from uh, OneCare that, that demonstrates that the 2019 programs qualify as scale target ACO initiatives and that describes how they align in uh, the key areas that I just talked about. Um, if they don't align and there will be some misalignment uh, expected. We want to understand the rationale for those differences. Um, in terms of timing, we'd like to get that report 30 days after the end of the first quarter of 2019. And then uh, if there are any programs executed after that date, for example, the new self-funded program, um, we would want OneCare to update the report um, within uh, a reasonable amount of time after that. And then second, uh, sorry, 15 days after that. <laughs> uh, number two, uh, you know, it's just we want OneCare to help help us get the information we're going to need to prepare some other reports that are required by the all-payer model agreement, um, s such as the payer differential report that we're going to have to submit in April of 2019. Um, yeah. And that's that's it for the recommendations here. Um, and then we're going to get into all payer model stuff. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Uh, good afternoon, Sarah Lindbergh, GMB, GMCB staff member here to talk about math. Uh, um, so just to kind of, and I apologize again for the poor color choice here, but just to reorient everyone about what we're talking about with the all payer model. We have like this top line is over time, people who actually live in Vermont with dashed lines indicating projections, so things that are not quite known at this point. Then we have for the all payer model a scale denominator for our full population. So there's a little gap there. There's certain populations that are not included in the model, such as people who receive their coverage through the federal government or the uninsured, stuff like that. Um, but for our financial targets, we have a further subsetting based on what data are available in VCures. And as you can see, up through 2016, that looked pretty well aligned with the scale until um, that GoBay decision kicked in. Uh, and at that point, we really have seen a drop in the claims available for our self-funded population. Um, so we still do get self-funded information for plans that um, don't have a choice about whether or not to submit, such as the state of Vermont and other governmental type plans. Uh, however, uh, those plans don't look the same as all self-funded plans, so we kind of have a biased representation of that market in VCARES. Um, then we have our scale target, which it, for 2019 for the full population is 50%. Um, this is the full ACO attribution that's expected through 2019, and then the ACO um, attribution just for Medicare. Um, as you can see, this is the smallest population, and for the first two to three years of the agreement, our financial targets for Medicare are just tied to this population. Uh, I'd like to bring to people's attention that smaller numbers often lead to more variability and noise in estimates, and so that um, it can be a lot harder to figure out the signal. So in all these things, um, we'd love to see these um, you know, slopes continuing to progress over time and get closer and closer to those um, financial populations up here, the line no one can see. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then as a reminder, um, while we do have some uh, inputs that are annual that affect the way we can set our Medicare benchmark, from a performance standpoint, 
we only have targets to through for the performance period to date so that compounds over time and right now we are looking at um, setting the second year so the first year was 17 to 18 the second year will be 18 to 19 so our financial targets are the compounding growth from 17 to 19. so for the all-payer population the target we have to date for those uh, two growth periods is 3.5% or less. Um, however, uh, corrective action would not be triggered unless we were to exceed a 4.3% all payer rate. Um, Medicare is probably the trickiest thing to wrap one's mind around. And for Medicare, actual performance uh, is never factored into the equation for our targets. It's all based on national projections. So the advantage of that is you know what your target is ahead of time. Um, but the trade-off is that it's hard to forecast very far down the line what those targets are going to be. Um, but according to the agreement, um, we're supposed to say 0.2 percentage points below these national projections, again, compounding to date. Um, but correct corrective action would not be triggered in, in that for those targets unless we were to exceed those compounding national projections by more than 0.1 percentage point. All right. Um, not all growth, growth rates are going to be the same. So, so, so for the commercial population, which is where the QHP um, bucket falls, uh, the self-insured population, which is where the um, last year's pilot falls, uh, Medicare, I think people have heard of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, but for all these populations, there's going to be some people that end up participating in the ACO and some people that are outside the ACO. These things might grow at different rates, and that doesn't need to alarm us necessarily because at the end of the day, we're responsible for all that spending when it comes to the all-payer target. So the if to think about how much the ACO spending is going to affect the full population, there's really two major variables. How many people are represented in the ACO? So how good is the scale? So higher scale is going to be more likely to influence the all-payer target. Secondly, the dollars. So more expensive populations are going to be more likely to influence the all-payer trend than less expensive populations. So getting more people in and getting the spending under control are kind of the keys to using this to affect that all-payer target. Um, for instance, uh, so if for some reason the QHP experience of the ACO attributed population is worse and they are growing at a higher rate, the all-payer targets help us correct for that because we get to count the whole QHP population. So non-utilizers, if good risk, we're going to go to a different um, provider or payer, I should say. So we get all that in our target. Um, so here we have um, what we're expecting for 2019. So this is this is based on scale, but um, for participation, you can see uh, Medicare. We're expecting about half of the population to be attributed to the ACO. Medicaid about 60 percent, and commercial wide, we're only at 12 percent. Uh, unfortunately, Medicare Advantage counts as a commercial plan, and that's uh, kind of where we have the least leverage. Um, Self-funded, we're projecting to be at 8 percent at this point. Um, which you can see is the tallest bar, and the fully insured is at 20%. Now, you have used your existing regulatory levers on all these populations through the hospital budget process. So any care they receive at a Vermont hospital, you've already had an influence over through that process. Um, for this population right here, you've actually set the premium for these people, so you have also um, kind of exercised a lever on that population. For this to be a really effective lever for the commercial market, and especially these guys, um, I, you know, I think the most important way to do that would be to increase the scale. You, you just need more people in before you're going to be able to move that needle, going back to the scale part portion of how this relates to the all-payer targets. Um, so based on our um, preliminary estimates, will definitely change. Um, this is what we think the total cost of care has looked like from 2012 through 2017. Um, so you'll notice that darn go bay thing just causes all sorts of problems. So even though the spending is um, stable between 16 and 17, the population goes down. So uh, unfortunately, when you especially are looking at anything based on the commercial market, you really can't do much trending prior to 17. Um, and we're we're working for ways to correct that. 
that. Unfortunately, it's it's a little bit um, hairy to take out the people um, that are either voluntarily submitting or um, don't have the option to not submit in that self-funded market. But we're trying to get a more apples to apples comparison prepared. Uh, but assuming this estimate, uh, so that would be uh, a baseline all-payer target of $496, which puts the per member per year um, just under $6,000. So if we compound that forward to 2022, the all-payer target would be just under um, $600 per member per month and just over $7,000 per member per year. Uh, as a reminder, these do their best to include a claims-based portion, which is based on that VCURES population, which is why GoBay causes problems, and then a non-claims-based portion. So for the non-claim spending, we're trying to align it closely with Medicare. So we're looking at the blueprint for health payments, uh, community health team payments that payers are making, and then um, as any you know non-claims-based programs might start up, we're trying to capture those and in information from the payers. So for instance, if you decide you want to pay for um, a joint replacement in a bundle or based on the, the episode, that might not go through a claim. So we just want to capture that kind of kind of spending. Um, and the other really important point is that these numbers are going to be different than anything you see in the contract with the ACO because we feel really strongly that we need to be made base it on the allowed amounts instead of paid amounts. So paid amounts make sense when the payers contracting with the ACO because that's the insurer's risk. That's what they're on the hook for. However, when you talk about um, the actual spend, there's the, what the insurer pays and the member's responsibility. And we don't want to set up an incentive for spending to look even because you're shifting more and more costs onto members. So that's why we are just focused in on that allowed amount for the primary payer. And the reason we focus on the primary payer is that we don't want to count spending twice. So for instance, if I have a commercial plan and I can't, uh, you know, I also qualify for Medicaid, Medicaid's going to chip in as a secondary payer to help me with the, my member share amount. So if I were to count all the spending, I would be double counting things. So by counting the first payer's primary uh, uh, allowed amounts, we're trying to get their best estimate of the actual spending. Anybody bored yet? <laughs> um, and so this is just focusing on that total cost of care population. So again, this is not the scale population. This is just people in VCURES. And if you, you'll see the you know the go bay dip again. But where we are here for the baseline spending, you'll see that about half the population is commercial, and the other half is pretty evenly divided between Medicare and Medicaid. Um, another reason where you know our biggest contributor has the least scale. So it's really important, again, to try and get more commercial business into this thing to make it an effective lever. Um, so this shows uh, the bottom line is, so now we're switching just to Medicare and we're looking at the total cost of care, but these are paid amounts. So this is just uh, focusing on the insurer pay, what Medicare pays and does not include the member's responsibility. So Vermont um, continues to be below um, the United States in terms of its growth. Uh, and, and underneath you can see kind of these historical annual growth rates over time. And I think what freaked everyone out was back in, um, 2015, Vermont grew at 4.3%, whereas the national grew at 1.6. Um, but we have not seen that trend so far continue. Um, Vermont's been pretty close to the national trends uh, as a statewide number. So, uh, but also, you know, smaller numbers, more variability. There is always a chance that we could have another 4.3% pop up. <clears throat> um, so. This is um, showing what the national projections, where do they, those come from anyway? So just for the setting, the Medicare benchmark, we do have to look at something that people refer to as the call letter every year. And this is something that is um, sent to commercial insurers as a way to help them set rates for Medicare Advantage plans. So they include the experience of the fee-for-service population for commercial insurers to, to base their estimates on. So they produce them for the aged and disabled population and the ESRD. Um, the reason that we divide this up into these two populations is because while these aren't a lot of people, they're a super expensive population, and so that kind of helps prevent 
too much mischief from the noise that we would expect to see from smaller expensive populations. So back in April of 2017, they said, well, you know, given the information we have so far, we think the PMPM for a typical Medicare member is going to be 825 bucks a month, and we think in 2018 it's going to be 848 bucks. So that would be that growth rate of 2.8%. But we use 3.5. <laughs> That's because we used a, 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 a convention in the agreement that allowed us to use what we call the floor. So we we're able to use that 3.5% uh, and be held harmless from, from what happens. So if we hadn't used the floor, we'd be basing the benchmark last year based on that 2.8 for the aged and disabled population. However, this April, in April 2018, they said, you know what, Basically, we've got better information now. It turns out we think that the PMPM was closer to 833 bucks last year, and now we think that in 18 it's going to be closer to 850 bucks. So we, you know, we got it a little bit wrong. We're going to adjust it upward, and now in 19, instead of predicting 889, we think it's going to be 891. So in other words, given the best information they have to date, they think the growth between 18 and 19 for the national Medicare population will be 4% for the aged and disabled, 3.3% for the ESRD, which blends to that 4% in the population overall. So that's where 3.8 comes from. So according to the agreement, we can only set our rate at maximum to be 0.2 percentage points below that estimate. So the 4% growth rate for aged and disabled, you take off the 0.2% and that's the 3.8. And stage renal disease, it's 3.3. We take off the 0.2 and we end up with the 3.1%. So again, just this is just projected growth. Actual uh, observed values nationwide may vary, um, but that is what we're on the hook for when we're looking at it. But that annual estimate is only important when we're setting the benchmark for the ACO. When, it, when we're actually um, held to a accountability for the Medicare total cost of care, right now our target is a combination of the growth from 17 to 19 that we're projecting. So if you stick in the 3.7, which is the floor, so that's the 3.7 minus the 0.2 gets us to the 3.5. So if you stick in um, that floor estimates is the first term, put in the projections for the next year, that means our target compounding 17 to 19 will be 3.7% for the aged and disabled and 3.3% for the ESRD. Put them together, what do you got? 3.7. So it's always going to be really heavily biased towards the aged and disabled because there's so many more people in that population. So what, where do we think we're at? Um, we think we're currently would guess that we are at 1.1% if we're looking at our growth, um, assuming that the 3.8 is realized. So I can walk you through this step by step before we get there, but we think that um, we're gonna see an actual decrease in PM, PM from 17 to 18 in our national actual observations. And if we assume that um, the whole population would grow at that 3.8, um, that would mean our performance to date would be 1.1. So again, the target is 3.7. We think we're subject to change, but based on the best information we have so far, that we're, we would estimate we're currently at 1.1% growth. Again, that's statewide, not just the ACO. Um, so uh, here we go. So perform. So again, uh, yeah. So for the performance years, early years, and one and two for sure, our uh, financial targets are going to be tied just to the Medicare people that are in the ACO. So the way we come up with this um, estimate is the actual ACO spending that will we won't know till the about you know the middle of 2019. We'll know what the actual spending in 18 was. We compare that to what we think the spending would have been in 2017 based on the same set of providers. So what it actually came in at, and then this fake year, basically. So we're trying to figure out apples to apples as best we can how the growth was. And so based on best estimates to date, the, uh, these are the per member per year costs we think we're going to see for 2017, and the range that we might come in at an, in at 18. 
the range represents the endpoints of the potential shared savings. So if the minimum savings were realized and the maximum savings were realized, um, that, that we would expect a 1.5% growth rate for the aged and disabled and a, a quite a substantial decline for the end stage renal disease, which is an overall decline. These numbers will change, um, the, especially the ESRD claims tend to have, uh, take a longer time to complete. So don't, you know, don't put these on your blog <laughs> quite yet. Um, we want some more information before we sign up for everything, but um, based on claims paid through June uh, with run out through September, this is our best current estimate. All right, and then you've heard enough from me. We'll turn it over to Jackie, right? Yeah, Jackie, just um, tell me when to click. Uh, certainly. Okay, so I'm on slide 23. Um, kind of to get back to what um, Sarah was just talking about, this is from the call letter, the 2019 call letter. Um, and one of the things that we were charged with doing was determining whether or not we basically agreed with CMS's projections um, in, and kind of comparing that back to what One Care has um, put into their budget. So I have pulled a, um, a piece from the call letter. You can see the, um, the blended CMS uh, U.S. cost per capita um, there at the top starting with 807 in 2010. This is updated each year in the call letter which is released in April and has projections for the future years. So you can see that um, going all the way down um, for the uh, population. And one thing to note, this is a blended figure. And what I mean by blended is it's blended of the aged and disabled and, abled and the ESRT. Um, so as you're kind of flipping back and forth between other parts of this presentation, especially what Sarah just went over, she flipped most of it out. Um, but here it's blended and it's based on the enrollment. Um, one thing to note is that the ESRD, while expensive, as you've just seen, is between 0 and 5 percent of the total um, population from a nationwide perspective. Um, then we uh, took a stab at um, deviating a little bit from, um, in that second chart, deviating from the CMS approach. Um, they obviously have much more data and more sophisticated processes to come up with their growth rate. But one of the things we talked about last year that I didn't go to outline this year uh, because I think we hit on it last year was that CMS is not always right in these projections. Um, and so based on that, we took a little bit different approach using historical um, experience that we see here in the growth rate of the top chart to come up with two separate growth rates. So we've got the CMS um, numbers of um, 4.63 and 3.7 percent, and then we've got our projections that are both in the 3 percent range at 3.16 percent and 3.13. Um, um, so to kind of get back to you know, what does this mean to us? As we roll forward to the next slide, um, we've got um, our, um, as we take the blending of those numbers from 2017 to 2022, you can see we CMS's national target is one point, or sorry, 4.01 percent over that that time frame, so that would be the national target. Um, then we would have to take the minus 0.2% that I know she's just spoken about um, to get us a Vermont target of 3.81 if we believe CMS's projection. Um, utilizing our projection, it takes it down a bit, um, so it makes the target to be a little bit more aggressive uh, because the growth rates are lower. Um, at 3.54%, taking out the 0.2% to get 3.34. I've also shown it graphically below to kind of show the deviation. Um, the one good thing about this graph is that if you compare it to last year's graph that we had in the um, presentation last year, 
Um, the gap between CMS and LE was much greater. Um, and so what's really happened here is that CMS's numbers have come down um, to be not exactly in line with what we projected, but it's definitely a closer representation. And they do end in 2022 uh, being a little bit closer together. On slide 25, I have kind of a, just a scenario to throw out to you, a couple scenarios to throw out to you guys. Um, I think given last year having such um, higher growth trends that CMS was projecting, um, this added a lot more color because one thing we were very nervous about um, was the fact that you know they were asking for some pretty high increases relative to the, the national target and then ultimately the Vermont target. And so in last year, it was it was really aggressive where there was a really high number in year one, which would have then required um, future years to have a much lower um, growth rate. We also know more now, and we know that our, as Sarah just went over, I believe it was a 1.1 is where we're sitting at, versus let's say if we were sitting at four and we had to drag that down over time. So basically what this is saying is that uh, the CMS target, the target is 3.81, which is the bottom figure, um, and l and &E target is 3.34. <coughs> basically what I've done here is shown some scenarios to say that, okay, since we had 3.5 in 18 and they are requesting 3.8 in 19. What does that mean in 2020, 2021, and 2022 that we could approve? Um, so from a CMS perspective, as long as the trends aren't going up, we should be able to hit the target because we've had favor we had a favorable request in 18, plus we're having favorable experience. Um, for uh, our projection, it does require a little bit of deviation where there are lower trends in future years in order to hit the 3.3. So this is more just informative and illustrative so that you can, guys, you can wrap your minds around what potential implications could come from approving a 3.8%. Is that, that does mean that their trends might have to be lower in the future, which I'm sure most of you understand, but I wanted to just kind of put that out there. All right, Sarah, you get to talk about um, your complicated formula now. Oh, I get the joy of this one. So, uh, this, yeah, no, so the, this slide is showing the um, 2019 Medicare benchmark calculation. And as you can see, uh, the, the overall benchmark for the ACO is really comprised of one benchmark for the aged and disabled Medicare beneficiaries and another for the end-stage renal disease beneficiaries. Um, to calculate those benchmarks, uh, CMS estimates the 2018 per beneficiary per year spending for those beneficiaries in each category who would have been aligned to the ACO in 2019 based on the 2019 provider list, which is a mouthful, but it's um, it's basically the, the hypothetical population, um, you know, based on uh, the ACO's providers and the performance year, looking back at the year prior to the performance year, who would have been aligned to the ACO and what are their, their costs. Um, and then you, you multiply uh, those uh, numbers by the number of beneficiaries in each category that are actually aligned to the ACO in the performance year, so 2019. And then finally, you multiply that by the trend factor or trend rate that's set by you and approved by CMS. Um, so we've got, you know, the kind of the calculation in words, and these are the numbers um, that are going to be used to, to, to plug in. Um, and we've we've modeled here um, <clears throat> the ceilings that that you could approve that Sarah talked about. So the three, um, basically three eight for aged and disabled, and three one for uh, ESRD. And then the box on the far right uh, reflects an adjustment um, for the ACO's shared savings in 2018. Uh, so initially, this gets a little complicated, but initially CMS is going to use. Uh, 
est estimation, an estimation of shared savings, uh, so 6.1 million, um, and then multiply that by the blended 2019 trend factor that the board approves, um, which we're modeling here as the 3.82%. Um, and that $6.1 million represents 80% of the approximately 7.7 .7 million um, this year for Blueprint and Sash. So um, that's gonna be used initially for that kind of shared savings adjustment. And then once the 2018 settlement is finalized and OneCare's actual shared savings or shared losses are known, then the benchmark is gonna be adjusted to reflect those actual shared savings or losses. So if OneCare ends up um, performing really well and saves you know, the maximum um, amount, uh, which we, th we think is about $16.2 million, then the benchmark is gonna increase. If they save uh, less than $6.1 million, then it's gonna go down. And then this slide is just showing a high level comparison between <clears throat> 2018 and 2019 benchmarks. Um, <clears throat> And I think it makes sense to go from the bottom up. So looking at the bottom, um, the total benchmark for 2019, uh, assuming the $6.1 million for shared savings and assuming those um, trend rates of 3.8 and 3.1, the total benchmark would be um, a little over $581 million, which is a 44% increase over 2018. Um, but looking at the the middle rows, um, you can see that it's not a great way to measure uh, ACO growth because the number of attributed lives is going up by 50%. And then going up to the rows at the top, you can see that on a per member, per month basis, the benchmarks are actually going down by between 5 and 6%. And the difference between the, the 5 and 6% is uh, the minimum and maximum shared savings for 2018. So that 825 PM PM figure is assuming 6.1 million and the 840 is assuming um, the max of 16.2 for, for 2018. Um, another point I just wanted to make uh, here is that uh, that $581.7 million that would be the benchmark um, assuming these inputs is like the other total cost of care targets in one cares budget targets for spending on ACO attributed patients. Um, the money is not, as you know, all flowing through one care. Some of it is, some, it, some of it's flowing uh, as all-inclusive population-based payments from CMS and DIVA down to one care and then out to providers. A lot of it is flowing around one care directly from the payers to providers uh, as typical fee-for-service payments, but OneCare maintains responsibility for those dollars. So uh, it's, a, it's a big number, but you know, it's the cost of caring for patients. It's not you know, um, profits or, or anything like that. So, uh, so that's, that's that. Our recommendations are here on this slide. So uh, the staff is recommending that you approve um, the 2019 Vermont Medicare ACO in initiative benchmark for one care using trend rates of 3.8% for the aged and disabled component and 3.1% for the end stage renal disease component. Um, you know, these rates are within the parameters set by the all payer model agreement. And as Sarah explained, based on our best estimates and the best data we have available would not cause us to exceed the Medicare growth target to date. Um, we also think that uh, savings generated in early years of the model could help offset uh, the additional risk that would come with increasing scale in the model or allow for investments in care transformation uh, without putting additional pressure on commercial rates. Um, and then finally, you know, the high levels of risk in the Medicare program, I think as you guys have heard, uh, have kept some hospitals from participating in that program. Um, and without the hospital in the program and accepting risk, 
providers in the community are, are by and large not able to participate in the program either. So we think that early successes in the Medicare program particularly could help increase participation and therefore scale. Okay, Jackie, I'm gonna um, turn it back over to you. Uh, we're on slide 29. Yes. Okay. okay, so we are in the process of reviewing uh, the Medicaid um, rate case um, with Viva. We have received um, data from Wakely. We're in the process of reviewing that to make our recommendations. Um, you will receive a report from us um, on recommendations that we have for Wakely and for their consideration before that rate can be finalized. Unfortunately, this information is confidential as the negotiations are ongoing. Um, so far, based on our uh, review as we're writing up the report, um, Wakely's range for growth will fall within um, the recommended range that and, and our best estimate that we have um, come to over the last week. Moving to commercial QHP on slide 30. Um, the negotiations are still ongoing between One Care and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont for both 2018 and 2019. Um, one of my biggest concerns regarding the 2019 um, you know, proposals, we've seen a few of them, although none of them have been finalized. Um, formally at this point, but one of my concerns so far is that when they were quoting figures in the initial submission, um, it was not consistent with the board's order um, during the QHP filing. Um, additionally, um, we have two recommendations, um, the first being that um, they blanketly took the trend figures from the um, commercial QHP rate filing. Um, we don't think this is appropriate. If you head back um, a few slides and you look at the percentage of those attributed to the ACO from this market, it's roughly 20%. That is a really small subset. Um, and this population, has, due to the attribution process, has different um, behaviors than those that are not attributed, such as you have to have a PCP visit, which means that non-utilizers are not ever going to be a part of the ACO under this attribution process. So they just will exhibit different behaviors and trends, so we recommend that um, those trend figures be developed from that population utilizing data that, that they should have available to them. Um, the final recommendation is um, another one based on our observations from the, um, the note above is that one care was utilizing figures within their initial um, submission that were not, um, not appropriate, meaning that I know that some pharmacy is, is not covered under this, yet they were using a blended trend figure. Um, so our recommendation is that they use Blue Cross's um, final filing if they are going to do references to it. Um, that final filing was based on the board's order. Um, that's a really helpful um, uh, process that we have in place in Vermont is that after the order, um, comes from the board, each of the carriers submits a new filing with those rates supported um, based on that order, and we recommend that be referenced. Within the initial submission, um, the l &E report was referenced, which is on a completely different basis because it's from the Unified Rate Review Template, or URC, um, and so we just want them to be more mindful of the figures that they're using because we felt, we felt like they were misrepresented within the submission itself. Moving to slide 31, um, we agree with the staff recommendation to approve the Medicare uh, benchmark trend rate of 3.8, which was requested by OneCare. Um, we believe that our recommendation will fall within Wakely's range for Medicaid. 
of which we cannot speak to um, quite yet publicly. And then for the commercial QHP, I, I just outlined two of our recommendations that you can see on the prior slide. One final recommendation that we have is, is really in regards to the overall um, uh, one, the targets that are set. Um, we really don't believe it is our responsibility to ensure that uh, the two parties between the payer and one care, um, we don't believe we are part of that process as they're negotiating. We can offer up recommendations um, and then evaluate those agreements. Um, but we're, we're heavily relying on the actual expertise at the table as well as those other professionals. Um, one recommendation we have is that OneCare provide an actuarial certification um, for the commercial benchmark, um, really just to ensure that they are adequate but not excessive. Um, we've spoken with OneCare and they seem to be in agreement um, that they should be able to obtain an actuarial certification. And this would give us comfort that um, their actuaries are involved and have um, truly assessed the risk of these target figures. Um, the next thing we recommend is that one care provide the board with um, how the each of the targets builds up to the overall rate of growth across all payers and how that fits in with the um, target um, that are part of the all-payer model ACO agreement. Um, because we don't have agreements across all the payers, that was not something we could easily assess. Um, so we would really um, encourage the board to require that just so that we can know that they are on track with the requirements within that agreement. And then finally, we think that the board should see a revised budget once all these benchmarks have been finalized so that you to get comfort that um, all of your um, orders and all of the recommendations that were made were probably This slide here shows the risk by hospital, uh, by payer. See Medicare, Medicaid, the Blue Cross QHP, as well as the risk mitigation for those three hospitals for which they are mitigating risk, as well as at the very end, the estimated MRL. This table here shows by hospital and HSA the MRL. Um, we went ahead and took the day's cash on hand from their 2019 approved budgets and translated that to how many days cash on hand the MRL is equal to and then took MRL as a percentage of days cash on hand um, down at the end here 
um, per Jackie's recommendation, we made sure that all the hospitals are under 5%, which they are. Um, once we do reach 5%, as we move further into the all-payer model, if hospitals are taking on additional risk and we go over, then we do need to reevaluate how, how this is working. Um, one item to note, on the previous slide, you can see the Medicare risk here. This number, we received the Medicare benchmark earlier this week, and that number there goes from 23 million to almost $30 million. What we did do to make sure that the hospitals are under that 5% for their MRL was assume that they were allocating proportionally to those hospitals taking on Medicare risk. Um, and re-ran the numbers, and no one is over that 5% mark. Jackie, do you have anything to add there? Um, I will add that we, uh, this is gonna be a, a, a work in progress on how best to assess, and really just to inform you of where the hospitals are, you know, at the most risk, because um, I know that you guys are heavily involved with the hospital budget process, so you can have some influence or inside um, information um, into the risk that they're taking. Um, we also looked um, at a few other metrics, such as the current ratio and you know, percent of so what that MLR was like a percent of revenue. And one of the things that led me to really focus in on the day's cash on hand is that it took into account their other obligations. So looking to just the revenue, I mean, again, you saw very small pictures for the most part as you look across the hospital. But my concern was we didn't know what existing with expenses or liabilities that they had outside of that, where the way of cash on hand does really help assess kind of what other obligations they have out there. So um, the 5% um, I chose because one, none of our hospitals did that at this point, and based on feedback from one care and looking at the financials, um, so far the risks they've taken on over the past couple of years have not impacted any of them financially. So I felt like looking to them to create that benchmark would be an appropriate, um, you know, best way to go about it. And again, if we have a hospital that approaches or goes above the five, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily in nature. I just feel like at this point, let's keep this as low as we can for now, and then start to um, assess that more going forward. Um, but I think this would be one of the best measures we have readily available from that hospital growth process that could be monitored um, over the course of the year. And that is something that our hospital budget team will continue to monitor throughout the hospital budget process. So moving on to staff recommendations, um, we want um, we recommend that the maximum amount of risk that one care may assume for 2019 is the sum of the 5% of the Medicare benchmark, 4% of the Medicaid benchmark, 3% of the commercial Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP benchmark, and 1.8 of the commercial self-funded program benchmark. Um, we also recommend that one care request and receive an adjustment to its budget prior to executing any contract that would cause it to exceed those risk levels. We also recommend that one care provide the board contracts with the hospitals who are taking on risk that one care hold at least 3.9 million dollars in reserves by the end of 2019 and that one care must inform the board whether it has secured aggregate total cost of care protection for medicare or any other payer in 2019. jackie anything else on the recommendations right moving on to the budget administrative expenses so you can see here um, the operating margin and total margin. There really hasn't been much change here. One thing to note as far as those two metrics go, um, in 2018 through the budget order, you approved it 
You approved one care hold reserves, but we didn't indicate where specifically it needed to hold those reserves. Therefore, we've got this 0% operating in total margin. When you look at this 0.3%, operating total margin in the projections and the submitted budget for 2019, that 0.3% is strictly the reserves, which are currently falling to the bottom line. When we move on to the administrative expense ratio, we can see that it's actually decreasing from the 18 approved budget to 18 projection. It's up a little in the 19 submitted budget, but that's also taking into consideration that OneCare has incorporated programs like Rise Vermont into its operating expenses, um, increased FTEs um, for those additional programs that they're, they're offering. Um, debt ratio and current ratio remain somewhat constant. As far as recommenda staff recommendations in this section, um, in the same, uh, same way as last year, we recommend that OneCare's administrative expense ratio must be consistent with its proposed budget. If the expense ratio increases by more than 1% from the budget, that OneCare must promptly inform the board. Also in the same, same way as last year, we recommend that OneCare ensure its administrative expenses are appropriately allocated by state and then finally, that one care must submit its audited financial statements as soon as they are available and must submit information as required by the board to monitor its performance. All right. Send the mic back. Thank you. And last but not least, I'm going to speak about the programs and investments. On November 14th, Hold on, let me switch slides. Okay. On November 14th, when we presented to you, we reviewed the population health uh, program, program and programs and investments. And as you will see in 2018, they had budgeted 27 million. And in 2019, they submitted a budget with uh, $37 million. Do, and this increase is due to the attributed lives and the addition of new programs. Okay, so the state is, con is receiving continued funding through the Medicare Next Generation Program to continue their support of the multi-payer advanced primary care practice demonstration started by the Blueprint for Health. So OneCare has budgeted dollars to continue the prim um, patient-centered medical home le legacy payments, CHT and SASH expenditures at a 3.8% increase over 2018 budgeted, which is the Medicare benchmark growth trend that we recommended earlier and that OneCare is requesting for 2019. This is a list of the new population health program investments, and we did review these in detail on November 14th. Um, they're expanding the comprehensive payment reform program for independent providers to participate in a con uh, capitated model. And we are also um, going to monitor and examine the specialist program, which is going to uh, allow OneCare to focus on population health quadrants two and three, which is the rising risk population. They're expanding OneCare um, Rise Vermont. They're also um, working with VDH to um, pilot the Dulce project, which is currently in one community, and they're looking at expanding that to three communities. And then finally, they've budgeted for an innovation fund. Um, they're planning um, to issue at least one or two um, cycles this year for communities to test and spread innovations to communities. Sorry, hard to go last. So we reviewed these earlier. These were all budgeted in their 2018 um, submission, and they are continuing in their 2019 submission. So finally, we have a number of staff recommendations for conditions on their programs and investments. Uh, number 12 is the payment reform investment ratio and blueprint funding. 
Um, we are recommending that One Care fund the population health programs at no less than 3.6. Um, we are allowing a 0.5% variance this year because there could be ramp up with new initiatives. Um, we recognize that. Um, so One Care must also fund the SASH and um, CHD payments to the Blueprint for Health at the 2018 Medicare level plus an inflationary rate of 3.5 in risk and non-risk communities. We're asking them to follow up on the 2018 um, CPR pilot to provide us a final report comparing the 2018 quality outcomes of the pilot with a non-pilot cohort, analyzing how the payments compare to payments hospitals are making to primary care providers not participating in this pilot, and describe the practices experiences with the pilot, for example, if they have experienced a reduction in administrative burden. We would expect this report be submitted in the fall of 2019, which would allow for claims run out. Similarly, uh, on the expansion of the CPR program in 2019, uh, OneCare, we've asked them to provide an interim financial report by July 30th, 2019, to describe changes from 2018 to 2019, uh, with an analysis of how the payments are re uh, received by the practices under the pilot compared to payments hospitals are making to primary care providers not participating in the pilot. We received a similar report last year. We have, um, we've requested a report for the, by the fall of 2019 that OneCare described their progress toward a new distribution methodology for their value-based incentive fund that they are uh, projecting would be implemented in 2020. And then finally, we would like a report on the Community Innovation Fund and Specialist Pilot to mon monitor the distribution of the funds. And we would like to work with OneCare to um, understand how the innovation funds are balancing a statewide approach while considering regional community needs. Thanks. So next, next steps, uh, like Susan mentioned, we've extended the public comment period through the end of the week, um, which is as far as we can go if you're voting on Monday. Um, we uh, will come back on, on Monday and um, do any sort of follow-up that we need to do with you, and, and then hopefully uh, get some votes from you on, on two subjects. So first, um, our recommended approval uh, of the 2019 Vermont Medicare ACO Initiative Benchmark for OneCare. Um, going back a number of slides now, uh, just to remind you, we're recommending the 3.8 for the A and D component and the 3.1 for the ESRD component. And then uh, the second vote would be on OneCare's 2019 budget. Um, and again, we're recommending uh, that you approve that budget with conditions around rates, risk, um, reporting, investments, administrative expenses, and all the... Um, 16 conditions we went we went over and that, that's it for us happy to try and answer questions thank you mike uh, team that was a, a very thorough analysis and much appreciated by the board are there questions from the board i have some questions i'm wondering um kevin do you want me to go through my questions are sort of span multiple topics do you want me to go through the, all the topics or do you want to do it by topic why don't you go through all the topics? Okay. Take it away. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to do this by slide number. Um, so on slide 11, um, and this is more of a comment than, than a question. Um, in, I just thought it was important to uh, really remind all of us where the 3.5 to 4.3 range came from, which was when the agreement was being negotiated, there was an, a lot of analysis on Vermont's statewide economic growth. Uh, and the, that range is based on different periods of time, um, with the goal, of course, of bringing healthcare costs, which historically have grown faster than uh, the economy, closer in line if not in line with the state's economy. And again, the thinking there was what we've seen in the past is that as healthcare costs grow faster, that's created wage stagnation as employers put more money into the healthcare costs in term, rather than into wages. So 
uh, that, that's really just a comment um, because I think it's easy as we delve and do our due diligence in the weeds to lose sight of the forest and the big picture. So um, I don't expect you to respond to that, but I did just want to make No, that the, the context is helpful. Good. Um, and I also wanted to comment that, on, that I found slide 13 very helpful because I think as we're, as we are pursuing this regulatory process of reviewing the ACO budget, we need to keep it in context of the overall goals of the agreement and our regulatory responsibilities on a statewide basis, which obviously go beyond, as Sarah mentioned, uh, just this regulatory process and into the hospital budget and our rate review process. So uh, for me personally, it was very helpful to understand the commercial attribution as being just at 12%. Um, in terms of understanding how that rate of growth for the ACO program fits into the larger context of total cost of care generally. Um, because quite frankly, it seems to me that at that low an attribution level, uh, the commercial rate could be even higher than what we approved in the QHP filing and, um, and really have no, make very little difference for, until we get more scale in that program on the total cost of care. So I wanted to say that out loud and kind of test that assumption in my thinking to make sure that I'm on target and you can correct me if I'm not on target. No, I, I, we've discussed that at great length, um, whether we can, you know, what do we do with without the parties being close on the commercial rate? And, you know, um, I think the answer is it, in terms of our targets, uh, we're responsible for Medicare and all-payer. In terms of the all-payer target, it, it's not going to matter all that much. And really, what are our interests um, that we want to recommend to you? And I think that um, focusing on having a, a rate that's actuarially based and actuarially sound is, is one. And then two, giving, um, you know, Jackie had some recommendations around what, what data to use and, and, and so on. but. Um, just giving the parties space to reach an agreement that makes sense for them and they're both willing to live with um, were the two kind of primary um, things we're trying to trying to get to with our recommendations. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, on the next slide 14, um, I just wanted to restate your what you said Sarah around why you why you think allowed is important um, in slightly less technical language <laughs> to make sure that we're getting it which is that uh, allowed makes sense because in addition to the part of the health care bill that the commercial insurer or Medicaid or Medicare are paying it also includes the co-pays the co-insurance the deductibles and you wanted to ensure that there wasn't an incentive for the payer to increase that cost sharing in order uh, to, to fit within a target. So is that a, a plain language, is that plain language summary a, okay? <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> you said it, just in, in a technical way that I wanted to make sure the plain language summary would be good. Um, on slide 16, which is the Medicare total cost of care paid amounts over time, um, I. I wanted to note that I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, Vermont is no longer growing faster than uh, the national growth rate, which was, as you mentioned, a major concern during the negotiation with CMMI uh, because, of course, we were worried about agreeing to a target which was below national if Vermont uh, was growing faster. So that is very comforting to me that we seem to be coming more aligned there. Um, on so I'm skipping now to slide 25, which is one of Jackie's slides. Um, but just in general, relating to uh, the different calculations and analysis that you provided related to uh, the Medicare total cost of care per beneficiary growth estimate, it was very helpful to me to have both uh, kind of the projections at the ACO level but again, because scale matters in terms of how the ACO program fits in with the total Medicare cost of care, um, 
it was very helpful to me that on slide 20, uh, you gave us the bottom line, which is that in terms of the total cost of care growth, we're at 1.1, which is well below where we think national um, is headed and, and exceeds our performance target of, of 0.1 below. So um, I think it's very easy for those of us who are not uh, sophisticated math people, which I would say I myself am not a sophisticated math person, uh, to think 3.5 means 3.5 means 3.5, uh, but that's not actually uh, how the target plays out. So I very much appreciate you um, giving us your best estimates to date and putting it in a context so that um, we can understand how our decisions today relate to the overall total cost of care estimate. So thank you for that. Um, on slide 27, Um, this slide, I think, was very helpful in terms of understanding the dynamics between total dollars, scale, and the PMPM. PM. And ultimately, it's the PMPM PM which matters uh, most in terms of our agreement and judging against the statewide uh, Medicare benchmarks. Um, and of course, in health policy, there's the old adage that bigger pools are better because just like with data, it adds stability and reduces volatility of experience. And I think this slide is very helpful in practical terms to show how that plays out um, in terms of the PMPM PM actually being reduced, even though the total cost of care is increasing and the population is increasing. Um, so that was helpful to me to be able to look at this and understand that as the Medicare attribution has grown, the PMPM PM has actually been reduced because the population has changed and we have a greater variety of health statuses in that population. And again, correct me if anything I'm saying doesn't make sense. Because <laughs> part of what I'm doing is just making sure that my understanding of what you articulated is, is right. I'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, um, so just jumping to the QH, the commercial QHP, which is slide 30. Um, so I, I, in terms of LNE's recommendation that the trend for the commercial rate be developed using the ACO population, Jackie, it was helpful to, for you to articulate that um, currently we're thinking the attribution is only about 20%, which is a very small subset of this population and has different trends. So the way that I interpreted that um, in, in sort of plain language was that we would expect, given the way attribution works, that the healthiest people would not be attributed and therefore the ACO population should, we would expect, have a higher trend than the overall QHP filing amount that we approved because we're really just looking at a subset and the healthy people are less, aren't less are going to get attributed. Um, so if if that thinking is not, if that plain language thinking is, is wrong, Jackie, please correct me, but that's how I interpreted what you were saying there. You, you just yeah. one, oh, go ahead, Jackie, sorry. Oh, yes, that's accurate. Um, one thing to note is that is within my draft report is that because the subset's is small, we may have credibility issues, which is what leads to kind of bullet point two. They may need to end up utilizing a little bit of that, the, all, the whole group, because, but to at least know what that is and then assess how you're gonna set your trends going forward. But that's absolutely in line with how I think about it, though I should caveat it and say, I do not have any data that is a, ACO attributed population specific for the commercial QHT. So it very well could not be the case, but your logic is the same logic I have. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I would just clarify that um, while health may be one reason people aren't utilizing, there may be other reasons that people don't have claims, but um, it's certainly a different, you would need to utilize to be attributed. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm almost done. <laughs> uh, 
um, on the programs and investments. So this is slide 41. Again, this is a forest for the and trees check-in. Um, I, I was happy to see that the 19 uh, submitted in terms of the programs and, and investments that the dollars had increased um, because one of the goals, I think, of the ACO program from my perspective was to find a way to shift dollars from hospital spending to primary care, uh, designated agencies, home health agencies, other community providers, um, and to prevention programs. And given that there's that percentage of the all-inclusive population-based payment that's taken off of the hospital spend to reinvest into these other programs, um, I was, I'm, I'm pleased to see that that at least appears to be growing. Uh, because I do think that that is, uh, has the potential, again, it's early years, uh, but it has the potential to shift our healthcare system in more meaningful ways. Now, obviously, at our current scale, that may not happen, but because there is this tension between scale and results. Um, but I was pleased to see that that was growing. Um, and thank you also for reminding us again that this is now our way that we're able to continue Medicare's participation in the blueprint and SASH. Um, in terms of your recommendations, Melissa, when you spoke to, and this is 45, to recommendation 12, um, verbally you said you were recommending an inflationary rate of 3.5, but the slide says 3.8, so I just wanted to clarify uh, what your, your recommendation. 3.8, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Th I thought probably 3.8, it was just a... Yeah, yeah, no, it's just a, yeah. yeah. there's a lot of numbers in this yes, whole thing no, that no, are very not similar. Criticism. I just wanted to make sure the record was yeah. clear more than <laughs> anything you. else. Um, and then lastly on 16, I, I appreciate this recommendation very much. I think when we had our board meeting in at Mount Escutney Hospital and we heard from the Windsor community, um, we started to actually get a, a flavor of how uh, some of the community investments um, were flowing through, at least in that one community. So I like, I'm glad that we are, that your recommendations include follow-up reports on the new programs, um, which quite frankly doesn't give us quite the same flavor as I think our meeting did, but is necessary for us to try and understand how things are flowing through at the community level um, as well. And that's all I got. Okay. Other comments from the board? Tom? So I, um, I only have a few here, but I'm just trying to make a connection between the budget document uh, that was submitted by One Care and going to slide 26. And uh, so I, I'm just uh, I'm numbers here that I just, just want to have some prediction on. Um, on slide 26, it talks about the 2019 uh, uh, attributed um, beneficiaries but to the ACO at $15,575. Uh, in the budget document, um, their attribution number is... And Less. Yeah, it's less. <laughs> and, and it's yeah. Four thousand three ninety-eight. So that's a big spread. It is a big spread. As to what separates those two numbers. Uh, well, the first one is one cares estimate at the time, and the this one is the actual numbers based on what CMS has run in their system. And it's really important to note that not all um, fifty-eight thousand five hundred seventy-five people are going to make it to January one, so a lot of them ultimately will not attribute. Right. Um, so the actual attribution number will be less than this. Um, I think you know it, it, it'll still be higher, I think, than the ACO um, budgeted, but not um, not quite this different. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next one is on page uh, slide thirty-nine. Especially my own writing. Yes. Uh, and as I read this, um, the uh, uh, number nine here it says that uh, increased by more than one percent. Um, and um, 
I'm, and I'm looking at the, uh, the, the percentage of the administrative expense ratio uh, that is calculated from budget documents, um, and it's 1.77%. So as I read this, uh, it could be interpreted to mean that it could go to 2.77%. There seems to be a very large margin or a large flexible buffer um, around that administrative expense. And I'm just wondering, if, am I reading that right, that, that um, uh, one care could, could actually have an administrative expense of so 2.7 percent um, and would not have to come and report to the board about that? That's correct. We do receive quarterly reporting, so we do see what that is ongoing. Um, I think the flexibility is there as we as, as they begin this, this business, I mean, worst case scenario, one of the payers drops out and that does, you know, they still have to pay people. They still have to pay their rent. Um, so one quarter of that, in theory, you know, one of the worst case scenarios is it's really high. Um, and then they, they write that it, but it might not be correct by the end of the year. And so we, that's what we found out. So I get that, but it still seems like a big margin to me. Um, if the base is 1.77%, uh, uh, an up, ups, upside limit at 2.7 percent seems like a, a, a pretty healthy margin of, of error or or incredibly catastrophic event happens, which I guess could happen, but I hope it won't. Um, let's see. Um, I'm interested in some follow-up on some language that was in uh, the board order uh, last year. Um, and it was, uh, it was, oh, uh, it's a read one, I'll, I'll read it um, because it's a brief one. It says, in consultation with the Green Mountain Care Board staff, one care must identify a pathway by which potential savings from this model will be returned to participating commercial premium rate payers, initially focusing on those individuals with qualified health plan coverage through Vermont Health Connect. And so I, I know that this past year has been for some people in the QHP population, a good one because of uh, the silver loading. Um, but for others, it's not, not so much. Um, um, and I, I'm still interested in, in developing, having at this point in time as we move forward, assuming the best for the ACO that it's going to work and that there will be savings um, and that some of that might be go back to solve some of the affordability problems um, that we all know exist. So um, I'm just kind of making that point that that was in last year's order, and uh, you know maybe as part of this process, I'd be trying to willing to work with you for some language to update that. But um, I, I just don't think we should lose sight of creating that pathway between a successful ACO and uh, um, people, especially the individuals in, the, in QHB plans. Yeah, uh, we haven't lost sight of it, but um, happy to work with you on on okay. potential language and around my that. My final one is just just a, a broader question: Is that um, in his testimony to us, um, Todd Moore said on, on the ACO budget when he presented it, he said, "I know that from being in the room that CMMI innovation under CMS was concerned the most fatal flaw in how we constructed it would be that Medicaid would underpay or even go backwards, and that therefore." looked like it wasn't providing affordability for Medicare. Um, and so I know in the all-payer agreement, if there are somehow contributions that are directed at offsetting the cost shift, that those don't count um, in the total cost of care calculation. But I'm just wondering, how would we know if, if uh, the, the concern that Todd raised is actually unfolding over time? Um, and I say that when I look at the uh, per member per month increase for Medicaid at 0.51 percent for 2018, and they're proposed at 0.5 percent uh, per member per month uh, for 19. Um, and I know how those are determined actuarially. Uh, well, I don't know precisely how they're determined. I don't depend on folks like Jackie to tell us that, but um, and and Sarah. But I, I I don't know where to look to see if the cost shift is getting worse and therefore affecting. Um, um, the ACO in any way. Well, so uh, y you're you're right about being held harmless for growth associated with Medicaid price increases, and we're um, we're working on uh, how to um, calculate that. It, it takes some time because you got to get the year in the books and uh, figure out what the 
dollar value of the increase was across all the Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, and then, so we're, we're working on that for 2018. We're going to be submitting that um, at some time in 2019, depending on we, when we can get the data. As far as like how it, how this is reflect, how Medicaid pricing changes are reflected in the rates, um, we're going to tr try and uh, give you that that number of like what's the overall um, increase uh, across all the Medicaid eligibility groups and what percentage of that is associated with pricing increases. Um, so you should. So hopefully it'll be clear to you like what what's price and what are we held harmless for under the agreement. And that's in the Medicaid rate case. Uh, you would give us that. Yes. Just because that was not clear. From Yep, sorry. Thank you. Maureen. <laughs> okay, I just have a few questions. On slide 20, um, and Sarah, I know you went through a lot of numbers <laughs> on calculations, but when we look at the 1.1%, and I understand the total cost of care is different than necessarily just the ACO, but when we see that the ACO is 3.5% last year and 3.8% this year just on Medicare, you know, so that would combine to be, you know, somewhere in between, and we look at the measurement of 1.1, um, this may be an offline request, but, you know, really marrying those two up so, so as we look to the future for five years out and be able to understand how we're tracking, um, it's difficult when we're looking, you know, at a 3.8 this year and then translating that to, you know, a 1.1 overall. And I, I know that the numbers are, you know, the population sizes are different for each one, but maybe if you can reconcile offline how to correlate the two, you know, especially as we're going to get year after year, be looking at this compounded growth rate. Um, the 1.1 to me was a surprise as being relatively low um, versus the year over year changes that we know were appropriately granted at 3.5 and then depending what we do for this year, you know, up to 3.8. Yeah, sure. Um, so, and I think I may have misspoke. Th these numbers are based on, on the ACO's performance or expected okay. performance. So um, the reason that this might be, so, what, so uh, when the benchmark is set, just like this year, it's based on an incomplete year of claims. So um, we, we pick, pick that target, and that's what we're trending forward by the 3.5. Um, but if the base rate ended up being lower or higher, um, that 3.5 isn't necessarily setting in stone how the ACO, ACO will grow. So we need to complete the hypothetical performance year get the current year in the books before we really know how we're going to perform. Okay. So it's really going to, I think it's just important for everyone to see that we're going to need to track, you know, the numbers Absolutely. that are approved aren't yep. necessarily translating into what actually is happening. And, and so it's hard to jump to where we're going to net out without that. Yeah, absolutely. And another important um, component is that um, whereas for the benchmark, we're, we're we're counting kind of the entire shared savings as uh, PMPM for the ACO population. For, for performance, I don't think that's appropriate. I think we need to spread, spread that through the full Medicare population because they're getting the blueprint payments whether or not they're attributed to the ACO. So that's another kind of delta, but we'll certainly make sure that we make that as clear as mud. No, <laughs> yeah, it's as clear as we can. <laughs> um, and then the next, just to talk a little bit about the risk and the risk quarter. So if you go to slide 34, um, one of the things that surprised me a little bit, and I understand when we get the submission from the ACO, um, you know, the timing of that and, and what the actual attribution is changes. But when we look at the Medicare risk of 23 million that was submitted and the budget that was submitted from OneCare had $460 million targeted for Medicare. And if that changes to 30 million, if that's the new number, then that now means there's $600 million that will be attributed through the ACO. And I just wanted to make, sure, you know, just question, is that the case? Because obviously that changes a lot of the budget numbers that w we've reviewed and were submitted. And when we look at percentages, um, as far as program costs and things like that, you know, it's pretty impactful if it goes from 460 to 600. 
I think it's good that we have more attributed there, but mm -hmm. I think it just shows to the timing. And you know, so how do we get the new information and you know get the new change on the risk total for Medicare? I mean, that would be uh, there are going to be moving parts up till the end. Um, so I mean, it would really be a matter of receiving updated projections um, from the ACO. Um, also, the, the 2018 settlement is going to be a significant alteration. So okay. what the I mean, it's a big change to go from 460 to 600. So I, I would just maybe, you know, it's revisiting with the ACO, you know, how we would look at that. Um, and to that as well, the slide before that that talks about the risk corridors, um, you know, if we put on this slide what we had for 2018, right? So Medicaid went from, I think, of what was a 3% corridor to the 4% corridor, and then Medicare went from the 80 to 100%. So we're actually increasing the risk corridors up on Medicaid and Medicare. Um, the interesting part about that is when we correlate that to the hospital budget process, you know, one of the big concerns was the risks that's out there and actually providing for that risk pretend, and more, more focus on the downside piece of that. Um, and here with the ACO, we're actually expanding the risk corridor, which puts more potential risks on the hospitals to the extreme. You know, obviously we hope we get savings, right? And that, that opens up from both sides, clearly. But one of the pressures on a lot of the hospitals were they're providing for that downside risk, not necessarily forecast, forecasting a, you know, the potential savings. And just, you know, this probably is a question back to the ACO, but, you know, how was that received by, I know their finance committee approves it, but I was surprised so early in the process we're jumping to expand the risk corridors, which puts more potential risk, as we saw on the, you know, maximum risk limits out there, which are on the backs of the hospitals because it gets passed through. It's not on the ACO itself. So it may, may be a question more, you know, I can follow up with, with Tom on that. Um, and I, you know, I understand there's hope for the savings and I hope we get that, but a lot of the discussions with the hospitals and, and how their forecasting has been on the downside reserve and some of them providing for that and this is going to create more and now even more so because we're going up from 23 to 30 million. So, um, and I guess the last question I have is really just on um, slide 34 on the commercial. And I understand that, you know, those haven't been negotiated. Maybe it's not slide 34, slide 30, sorry, on the commercial. Um, but once that does get finalized, just having the, um, ACO report back to us what the implications are for total dollars. If there are changes made, um, one, if they are to be consistent with the board order, those changes would have been, we had things in for affordability, we had things about the AHP plans, um, you know, what would that be? And I understand there's negotiations still between the ACO and the commercial insurers, so that's not set yet, but I think in the order that you're putting forward, it's that we get what those, cha those changes and implications are. So, thanks. I have some general comments that I'd like to make, um, observations and responses to public comment that we've received, but I think maybe I'll wait until after public comment and make my comments if that's okay. That'd be fine. So at this point, I'll open it up to public comment. Again, I'll remind everyone uh, to when you're called upon, please um, rise, state your name, what town you're from, and direct uh, your comment through the chair. Who would like to begin? Good morning still. Mike Fisher from Lincoln. Um, uh, Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to say a few words about the process um, that we're in the middle of and to um, recognize that the, uh, my office uh, has submitted written comments. I, I know that those written comments have um, evoked some stronger responses this year. We, we were harder this year. Um, and um, it sort of leads me to want to say, stand up and say out loud that um, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate does support the goals of the all-payer model. 
Um, when I'm on my game and doing my job well, I take the time to slow down and to look at the cases that come in the door at the healthcare advocate's office. And um, it's not unusual that uh, I see one that some version of, of one that came in yesterday. Um, some version of, I'm really sick, I'm really scared, I don't know how I'm gonna pay for it, so I've canceled all my medical appointments. So are we impatient at the Office of the Healthcare Advocate? Yeah, we're impatient. And um, it's important that people understand sort of, sort of the motivators, the, uh, the pressure, uh, the reasons why we're impatient. If I told you more details about the case, that case, um, half the people in the audience would sigh a relief and say, at least it wasn't my part of the system's fault. And the other half would groan about challenges that are beyond their control. Uh, it's a big, complex system. We get it. Um, we get it that, it's, uh, that uh, the task in front of the board is a very complicated one, um, one with, with some limited limitations of powers and stuff beyond their control. And we also get it that, um, to use the metaphor that's so often used, it is a big shift to turn. And it's going to take time. Um, so, um, but sticking with that metaphor for just a minute, when, when you have a really big ship to turn, um, you put the right amount of pressure on it uh, consistently. And so, um, uh, so uh, those are my reflections for the day. And I want to just say again, I, I respect the, uh, the challenging task in front of the board. And, um, and I apologize if I sometimes sound like a broken record. Um, but I bet you I'll stand up and say something similar in the future. Thank you, Mike. Is there other follow-up comment? Susan? Um, yes. Hi. Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council, um, and I live in East Montpelier. If you could turn to slide um, 39, it's a slide about administrative expense. Um, I mentioned this in my comments, mm -hmm. but the time that I wrote my comments, I didn't have these slides available. So I didn't know what the recommendations were or weren't going to be. And that's why we extended the public comment period for another couple more days. So if you want something, your extensive file. Anyway. Um, last year, the board wrote in its order, while we believe that the all-payer model holds great promise for controlling health care costs and improving quality of care in Vermont, we understand the concern expressed by some that ACOs add another level of complexity and expense to an already complicated and expensive healthcare payment system. Board went on to say, ACOs should provide a net benefit to the system and we will monitor OneCare's administrative expenses to ensure they are less than the total healthcare savings generated through the all-payer model. The board included in its order, it was clause M I think, in its final order, one care's administrative expenses should be less than the health care savings generated through the all-payer accountable care organization model. So that was from last year's budget order, the 2018 budget. And we won't know one care's administrative expenses or the savings generated for 2018 till probably this time 2019. So one of the questions that I raised in my comments was, how is that going to be enforceable? What's the board going to do, you know, a year from now if one carrier exceeded its administrative expenses in 2018? And based on their 2017 experience, that seems really pretty likely. It could be possible that Michael's right and the one, you know, their savings in Medicare might be all those millions, but really their track record is pretty consistent with Medicare. They lose money every year. So, they had some savings in Medicaid this year, 2.4 million apparently in 2017, but that's nowhere near what their administrative expenses were. That was 2017. My question and my comments was, what are you, how are you gonna enforce your own order based on 2018? But my question right now here today regarding the 2019 budget is I didn't see a staff recommendation 
similar to the clause that you've had in the 2019 order. And as unenforceable as it might be, I think there should be something in the 2019 order, similar to what was in the 2018 order, that gets at some limit on what the administrative expenses should be. Some way to ensure your goal here that the ACO um, provides a net benefit and doesn't cost more than it might be saving. Thank you. Seeing none, um, I understand that Member Holmes would like to. I would. Um, and I've actually, bear with me because I've written down my thoughts because I had a lot of them and I, I tend to uh, like to write on paper my thoughts. But first of all, a genuine thank you to the staff for all your hard work here um, reviewing this budget. I know because I've been there and I've heard and I've seen. We've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours collectively, I think, ensuring that we have the necessary information to make these important decisions about how we pay for and deliver health care. So thank you. And I appreciated all of these uh, recommendations that you made today as I reviewed the ACO budget again this week and multiple times. So I'm going to keep all those recommendations in mind. I'm also going to keep the following in mind, and I really hope that others will too. And the first is patience. Uh, patience has become a lost virtue in our society. With one click, we can instantaneously see any movie we want. We can swipe right and find a date for tonight. We can post a picture and within an hour get an instantaneous gratification of 200 likes. And that works for some things, but not for everything. We cannot radically change the healthcare system with one swipe or one click, nor should we. Innovation takes time. Fundamental system change takes time. We need to be patient. It is important to remember that we're in year one of a five-year model. So despite the unrealistic, I think, expectations of some critics of the all-payer model, it may take years before we see significant quality and financial results. And achieving scale will take time too, and it should. That does not mean that the all-payer model idea is bad or that implementation is not going well. What it means, as any successful entrepreneur will tell you, is that innovation requires a willingness to take risks, constant iteration, testing and pivoting, and above all, patience. We need to take the long view here. The second thing we need to do is stay focused on the vision we had when we signed the all-payer model agreement. The key question, in my mind, will be whether this ACO budget helps us get closer to achieving a better health care system for all Vermonters. About two weeks ago, I asked my health economics and policy students to describe the features they think an ideal health care system would have. These are smart kids. They said, and literally I have their notes because I asked them to take a picture of it, they said an ideal system should ensure access to care, it should emphasize population health, it should reward high value evidence-based care such as preventative care, early intervention and disease management. It should discourage wasteful overutilization of low value care and the costly duplication of services. It should incentivize the development of innovations that both save lives and save costs. It should promote better care coordination. And it should recognize that a holistic approach to health care must extend beyond medical care to include the social determinants of health. Then I asked them how they thought the current system of fee-for-service measures up against those all ideals. They unanimously agreed that fee-for-service fails along almost every dimension. They also agreed that the ACO all-payer model with its shifting of risk from payer to provider through capitation and its quality accountability has the greatest potential to move us closer to our ideal. Again, smart kids. The all-payer model incentivizes care coordination and the utilization of the most cost-effective treatments. It promotes preventative care, early intervention, and disease management, which both save lives and lowers cost. Contrast that to fee-for-service, which does not distinguish between good care and bad care. Under fee-for-service, all care is incentivized, so you get lots of utilization, even the kind that does absolutely nothing for you, or even worse, the care that harms you. And complex care management, well, that's not reimbursed, so why would you bother under fee-for-service? In an all-payer model, technological innovations that deliver high-value care at low cost will be rewarded and adopted. In fee-for-service, there's no incentive to develop cost-saving innovations because high costs are just passed along to consumers and payers. And in an all-payer model, providers are held accountable for quality, not volume. So what a provider does, not how much she does, really starts to matter. So population health should improve at lower costs. And as costs come down and waste is eliminated, access should increase for all Vermonters. Ideally, the all-payer model is better positioned to achieve the triple aim than fee-for-service, which many of us, including most healthcare experts, agree is failing along all dimensions. But yes, the all-payer model requires a complete overhaul of our payment and delivery systems. 
While we monitor the entities we regulate, we need to be patient with the ACO and with the providers, hospitals, and payers who must completely transform their business models. Operations have to be re-engineered, provider practice patterns have to change, IT systems have to be developed to allow better flow of information, and that is going to take time. And yes, the system needs to be regulated, and fortunately, because of the Green Mountain Care Board's statutory oversight, we have one of the most highly regulated healthcare systems in the country. But I urge us to regulate patiently as the system transforms itself. Innovation is risky, but fortune favors the bold. And I appreciate the healthcare advocate Mike Fisher's comments that you just made and your support of the all payer model, but I still found it particularly disappointing that the state's healthcare advocate chose to ignore the steps we've taken and the progress our state has made towards a better healthcare system with unsubstantiated and misleading accusations, including a claim that the UVM Health Network is exacerbating Vermonters' affordability challenges and undercutting the success of the all payer model. To the contrary, the all payer model would not have been possible but for the leadership of the UVM Hospital and Health Network. And in fact, the communities in the UVM Health Network have among the lowest per capita total costs in the state. Healthy skepticism is important, but for naysayers, change will never be fast enough or indeed welcome. For those patient observers who remain optimistic and are willing to support the hard work that needs to be done to bring necessary reform to an unsustainable system, we are already seeing signs of change. Hospitals that once survived by maximizing tests, treatments, and lengths of stay are now working with their provider networks and community partners to find new ways to keep patients healthy and out of the hospital. We're seeing hospitals hire care managers and social workers for their EDs. They are embedding providers directly in schools. They're subsidizing the costs of housing and nutritious food for their most vulnerable patients. And they are investing in service lines like mental health, cardiac rehab, and palliative care that would be revenue losers in a fee-for-service world. The model is showing early signs of success, and we should be grateful to the early adopters such as UVM, Porter, CVMC, Northwestern, Springfield, and Brattleboro, and pairs like Diva who are leading the change. The healthcare system is changing in the ways we hoped when we signed the all-payer model agreement, and the ACO is facilitating that change. An ACO, I might add, that must be the most highly regulated in the country. Despite misleading comments by the healthcare advocate and others about the lack of transparency of one care, no other ACO budget could possibly have undergone such careful regulatory and frankly public scrutiny as this one, which is good. I think we need it, but it's happening. So as we analyze this ACO budget for the final time over the next week, the public should know that my colleagues and I have the best interests of the 625,000 Vermonters in mind. I will be working to ensure that this budget reflects a responsible use of our scarce health care dollars and also that the ACO's programming continues to encourage the type of system change that we envisioned and committed to when we signed the all-pair model. And I'm certain my colleagues will be doing the same. And I would urge all stakeholders in the room, particularly those working for state agencies, to consider ways in which their organizations can help move the all-pair model forward for the sake of all Vermonters. Those are my comments. Kevin, would you mind if I respond to a couple of Jess's comments. I promise I'll be quick. Okay, keeping in mind that it is past the noon hour and we're going to be back at one. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jess, I just wanted to say thank you. I think um, I think it is, as I said earlier, very easy to lose the forest for the trees, and so reminding us what the forest is is very helpful. Um, there's just a couple things that your comments uh, brought to mind that struck me that I thought it might make sense to share. One is around scale, because I think there's been a lot of criticism both that scale is moving too slow and that change is moving too slow. And those two things, to me, are in conflict, to say both of those things at the same time, because I think you can't expect operational change without scale. Uh, so I, I think that that's just something that as we're, as we're monitoring the model and uh, looking, as, looking forward over the years to, to evaluate that we need to keep in mind. Because without scale, there's no incentive for operations. And quite frankly, without adoption of the new payment model, as we saw with the shared savings program, uh, shared savings, I think, was well recognized as not being a sufficient uh, incentive in the provider community to promote operational change. So um, the other thing that struck me is that there is some literature that shows that uh, medical evidence takes 12 years from when it's a fact to when it is actually incorporated into practice. And so just to support your, your call for patients, 
Um, I, I think that's a tr an atrocious statistic because you would hope for faster uh, dissemination, but I think it also belies how hard it is to change operations and change uh, practice patterns. So uh, with that, I will conclude. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Robin. Just two seconds. I, I, I just uh, want to underscore Jess's point about patience. Um, in my in my career here in Vermont, uh, I experienced Act 60. Act 60 occurred on uh, pursuant to a Supreme Court uh, justice judge a Supreme Court decision on February 15th, and by June of that year, the legislature had passed Act 60. But it took years for the rollout of that and patience. And you can argue pro con Act 60, but um, it did equalize the distribution of wealth on a per child basis that uh, helped many school districts um, uh, across the state. Um, restoring the state's bond, bond rating took time and patience. Um, on health care, you know, in my view, this, uh, a lot of this started back uh, with VHAP and then with Catamount and then with the, the waiver in 2005, and we moved forward with Act 48, and here we are today still trying to solve this problem uh, that hasn't been solved yet. So um, I would just ask people to step back and, and look at anything in the public sector that is significant and transformational. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and uh, let's not make, you know, let's just be sure that we're not making um, perfection the enemy of the good as we go forward. Thank you, Tom. Um, just a reminder, we're recessing till 1 o'clock. We'll be talking about the uh, uh, ship and this afternoon there will not be a vote on the ACL budget that will be on Monday and with that I want to thank the team for again um, a great presentation be back at one So welcome back, everyone. We'll call the meeting back to order. And uh, um, Susan, do you have anything to say before I turn it over to uh, Heidi and Dr. Levine? Um, no, I, I, I actually, yes, I do. I forgot to mention, it's pretty obvious, but our general counsel reminded us after uh, my executive director's report earlier today that we won't have a board meeting the meeting the week of Christmas, which is the 26th, for folks who are planning that far ahead. That's it. And I guess we did announce uh, Monday's meeting, but we should also sure. stress that it is Monday, not Wednesday next week. That's right, and we have We do meeting. have one on Wednesday as well, but... Yep. The ACO budget uh, vote will be on Monday. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Heidi and Dr. Levine. And I'm not sure who's leading the charge over there. But <laughs> it's a joint effort, but I'm going to make the introductory comments. OK. Um, <clears throat> thanks for inviting us to speak today. I know you've been uh, steeped in budget discussions and budget decisions. I do a lot of reading, and you're in the news a lot, um, whether it be editorials, would like. <laughs> editorials, commentaries, opinion pieces. All of them have a common theme. They tell you what your role should be. They tell you what you should be advocating for. They tell you what you should be spending your time doing, how you should strategize, where the dollars should go. We're going to resist the temptation to do more of that. <laughs> We're going to come here with one sole uh, goal in mind, and that's to engage with you on our state health assessment, and more importantly, the outgrowth of that, which is a state health improvement plan. And we'll make an offer, not just for today, but for the future, um, if you'd like our expertise as educators on some of the areas we view as critical to your work and to Vermont's healthcare landscape, um, please invite us back, because we really are steeped in that area that I call the nexus of health, health care, population health, public health, and health policy. <clears throat> we know that uh, within healthcare, 
there's always going to be a tremendous focus on controlling costs and improving quality and improving what's termed the patient experience of care, as well as patient access to care. And those are critical components. You'll recognize them uh, as two components of what's fondly termed the triple aim. And it's the third component we want to engage you on more so today because it tends to be the forgotten component, and that's population health. And we're going to give it its full due. We now know that the state has really uh, not only dipped its toe in the water, but it's really getting more of its leg in the water with regards to the all-payer model, certainly in terms of covered lives. Uh, and that's in a very significant investment. investment. And though we know that delivery system reform and payment system reform are usually front and center and sort of the first two of the three to be addressed, there's of course a substantial population health focus within the all-payer model and there are metrics and outcomes uh, that need to be attended to uh, for us to properly uh, satisfy the mandates of that model. You're probably familiar with the Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health multi-decade initiative, which is to harness the power of cross-sector collaboration to advance health equity and improve health for all. Among other actions, this aims to create healthier, more equitable communities and strengthen the integration of health services and systems. And we, of course, subscribe to this. In terms of uh, the so-called determinants of health, we know that there's only 10, possibly 20% of a person's health determined by clinical care. That leaves, of course, 80 plus percent related to socioeconomic factors, fondly termed the social determinants of health, to environmental influences, and very importantly, to health behaviors. This discussion that we're gonna have will quickly show you how the work of our state not just the health department or the agency of human services, but all sectors of government and innumerable public-private enterprises and partnerships and the health department's ability to partner with the healthcare system can achieve significant progress in the long run, not just the short run, and achieve significant social as well as health outcomes. And the approach and the kinds of evidence-based prevention and investment strategies that we're going to detail will have the potential to truly address the root causes of the health problems that currently adversely impact Vermonters and the communities they live in, as well as drive the ever-increasing need for services and escalating costs that you are only too familiar with. This presentation fulfills the opportunity to consult with the Greenbaum Care Board before the plan is adopted, which I believe is Act 67? 167. 167. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to future conversations uh, as we develop the action plans in support of our state health improvement plan. I'm gonna turn the slide-based part of the presentation over to Heidi now, though I tend to interject liberally. But, I'll, but I will, I'll resist. I'm gonna leave it in the middle, so that will be nice and easy. Good afternoon, thanks for having me back. Uh, the last time I was here, I was able to share with you some of the preliminary results of our state health assessment, and on your desks, you will see your own personal hard copy of that assessment. And uh, this was uh, probably about a year in the making. And it was the first step of this process, which was uh, to make sure that we had an accurate sense of what is the health status of Vermonters, uh, and what are the core health challenges before we figured out what the state health improvement plan ought to be. So this is the basis. I know it's going to be very tempting to be looking at all these charts and graphs, but I'm going to ask you to hold off on that so I can have your attention, and this will just be a nice little goodie to take home. All right. So here's what we're going to do. It's I'm going to take you through why you, the, we are, oh, we'll see. I could be good. I could not be. Voila. 
ooh, the colors look different from here. So where I want to start with is just making sure that I ground um, us all in why, why am I even here? Why have we done this work? How does the State Health Assessment and Improvement Plan connect to the, um, the work of the Green Mountain Care Board and the authorities that you have? So um, big picture, as Dr. Levine outlined, is part of our health system reform and our focus on the triple aim. Uh, which is cost quality, and this is focused on our population health improvement goals. And as you know, when we talk about population health improvement, uh, we speak from the doctor for the whole state, and we, we mean the entire population. Um, it also fits with the ACO and the all-payer model um, in that we are looking to not only change our payment model and delivery system, but we're trying to create some accountability for outcomes health outcomes. And you all are very familiar with the fact that our existing state health improvement plan had three primary areas and goals. And those goals translated into measures, which then translated uh, into the accountability system within the all-payer model related to population health. What I'm going to present to you today is sort of the next iteration for you to consider as you think about uh, the work that you're doing under the all-payer <coughs> model and potential expansion in the future. Um, and then, as Dr. Levine mentioned, um, Act 167 was an update in 2018 that made it very clear that this state health improvement plan is the state health plan that sets the health priorities for the state as you consider um, how you want to uh, work with our health care system in meeting those goals. So, Graphically, I probably left out a whole lot of things, but trying to make it as simple as possible. How do we get here? So I want to put it in context. So where we started was we looked at the community health needs assessments that each of the hospitals have done, so not this round, but the previous round, to see what had they identified as the primary needs in the, the communities that they serve. We also looked at the data that was collected through the Agency of Human Services Community <coughs> Profiles work. Uh, each of the district offices of our agency went out and met with community and social and human service providers to see what they were identifying as needs in their community. So we, we rolled up the data from each of those efforts to say, here's what we know on the health side uh, from our health care system, here's what we know from our social service system. And then we added, we brought that data in as we looked at our state health assessment. Um, and many of you know that we have a very robust data center um, within the health department and ability to analyze data that we, uh, that which we technically own or govern and that which our, our, our counterparts do. And we look at uh, trends over time, place, and subpopulation on a regular basis through our surveillance system. But then with the state health assessment, we wanted to go and we dug a little deeper and we said, not only do we know that, but if we're going to take this equity lens that Dr. Levine mentioned, we want to dig a little deeper and see what do we know about particular populations that perhaps uh, we have some inkling might be uh, being left behind or experiencing greater health impacts. So that's what the state health assessment was. What do we know about the health of Vermonters? The state health plan that we're going to talk about is uh, what are we going to do about it, right? But it really, at this point, the plan is really a set of high-level goals and strategies. The work plan is what will come next. And we're hoping that the work that we have done, you will be able to use in the work that you're doing with the all-payer model, both to look at your goals and priorities, but the data that we've collected, the engagement that we have done with about 180 different entities in the state, a lot of them statewide or community-wide partners, to look at needs and data is something you can draw on when you are looking at um, the multiple decisions you need to make in regulating and uh, approving our, how our healthcare system moves forward in the future. So reiterating, so the state health assessment is what do we know about the health of Vermonters? The state health improvement plan is intended to answer what are the priorities what, and what are we going to do about the priorities? And I just want to reiterate what Dr. Levine said, and that the state health improvement plan, while it is shepherded by the state health department, it's within our mandate to carry it out, it is actually intended to be a plan for our state partners, public and private. 
Um, and you'll see when you see the scope that it is designed with that in mind. It is well beyond the capacities, authorities, and, and really the, the place for the health department to be in the lead. But we offer this as a guidepost to our multiple partners in and outside of government. I'm going to pause just for a second to make sure that you understand that what's reflected in the state health assessment and the improvement plan does not necessarily take the lens of the majority of Vermonters, like what are the majority of Vermonters experiencing, because we really wanted to look at inequities, and that is because we know we have so much in play already to meet those who are in highest need where we're seeing the, the greatest health outcomes you know the highest uh, disease outcomes related to chronic disease or suicide. You're already tracking those, right? But what we didn't have data for, we wanted to make sure we were looking at, instead of looking at everyone, what if we started with the people first and said, we know that there are certain populations that historically have had disparate health outcomes based on inequities. And that means that they have, um, the way that our society is structured, um, the way that decisions are made, the way that power and money flow, the way that history has presented itself. We now know that there are certain communities, not just geographic communities, but certain populations that are experiencing differential health outcomes based on race, class, gender, and disability. That's been proven in the literature again and again in other states, and there's frankly no reason to believe that we're any different in Vermont, but we did choose to look at it and make sure that our patterns weren't any different. Uh, so the state health assessment really focuses on that, and therefore the state health improvement plan will have a mix of those things that are for the population in general and those that are specifically targeted to these specific populations. This is a long way of saying it took us two years instead of one year <laughs> to get to our state health improvement plan, and the reason being we really wanted this to be a community engagement process as much as a data dive and planning process. And the reason that the community engagement process is so important is twofold. One, there's not, we can't possibly know everything from where we sit in government or in our agencies or on the board. We need others' perspectives to understand what's really going on in community and what the meaning is of the data we're seeing. Because we can describe what's happening, but not why. Figuring out the why, we need community partners to help us and others, right? And then the second reason to make sure we had such a robust partnership in doing this is that we're going to have five health priorities and close to 20 strategies that are going to require the participation and the leadership of many of those partners. Because many of the things, as Dr. Levine said, many of the solutions lie outside the healthcare system, right? Because many of the, the what the healthcare system can do is address 10 to 20 percent of health outcomes, and the rest needs to be by changing the conditions of people's lives, by working on health behaviors, and that takes more than our healthcare system alone can do. So having those partners engage with us from the beginning was extremely important. So um, this is the very quick list. Uh, the highlight summary from the state health assessment, basically when we rolled up all our data from the community health needs assessments, from uh, the hospitals, what we saw in communities through our social service agencies, and then the data dive that we did, and we had all those partners look collectively with us about what are the, uh, do, going through a ranking system to find some priorities based on opportunities for prevention, opportunities for improvement, impact on disparate populations. These are the ones on the left-hand side that popped up. There was consistency both with our internal so-called data and program experts, as well as our community partners around these five priority areas. So child development, chronic disease, mental health, oral health, and substance use disorder. Not a surprise, three of these are ones that are already part of our all-payer model. Um, health outcomes don't change at a population level, do not change that quickly over time. So there's some continuity between what exists now in the current state health improvement plan and the all-payer model and what will be moving forward. The addition really is childhood development and oral health. Um, and oral health, I know, is somewhat beyond the purview right now of the all-payer model because of the total cost of care. But I would say that in, in conversation with our community partners, 
they um, ranked oral health the highest priority need. Um, be, that is where they, we are seeing the most significant gaps in meeting the needs of our communities is addressing oral health needs. So I just want you to take note of that. Um, the social conditions that are on the right side, and you'll notice I moved from determinants of health to social conditions. Uh, and I'm waging a personal campaign to get rid of the word determinant because it sounds deterministic, right? It makes it sound like you can't change it. And the reality is you can. It's a condition. We can change those conditions. So the social conditions are housing, transportation, food, income, and economic security. And what's not on this list but will be on the list in the um, plan as we move forward is discrimination. So because in conversation through our outreach, that is the piece that related to the inequities, that there is um, there are many Vermonters who are seeing patterns of whether it's institutional discrimination or individuals discrimination that, that are impacting their physical and mental health and well-being. And so that is a condition that I think uh, will be added and that we can change. I'm going to skip this one because it's not useful to this conversation. Um, the selecting of strategies, so you know, this was just the process that we did. Again, it's what do we know about health? It's the data from the assessment. And then we charged ourselves at looking at the literature. We said because the two mantras in public health are uh, data-driven and evidence-based. So we did that work. We looked at the evidence to look at the literature. What do we know of the proven strategies? But then we also asked our community partners, what are some promising things that are happening in Vermont right now? Where are we getting some traction? And where are we seeing some positive outcomes? Because there's a lot where, frankly, we are on the cutting edge. And we, there's a lot of innovation that's happening in Vermont that would not be captured through the evidence-based literature. And we felt that was really important to include. So we looked at both of those. And we, we brought to our community partners, as I said, uh, I think 54 strategies that met both of those criteria. So it was evidence-based, promising practice in Vermont, it addressed inequities and showed major opportunities for prevention and upstream action that would ultimately uh, both improve uh, health outcomes and also reduce health care costs. So we brought 54 to our advisory committee and asked them, where do you see there's readiness for action? There are a lot of different criteria we could have used for priority setting. We particularly chose readiness for action, again, because we know that this plan is not one for government only, right? This plan has to be embraced and moved with our partners outside of government and in community. So readiness tells us that if it's what can move, because you can have the best evidence-based strategy, and if no one's behind it, it's a non-starter. So that was our primary criteria after we used our other ones to figure out readiness. I don't imagine you're going to be able to read this. Good luck on the, with the handout, but I'll try and walk you through it. Um, this is the one-page summary we're working from now. The language is terrible. Let me just acknowledge that there'll be a lot of language changes, uh, and there's a lot of, as uh, our Secretary of Human Services said, bureaucratic gobbledygook listed here that the average person is not going to understand. So by the time it is translated into a state health improvement plan, ideally, this language will be cleaned up and, and recognizable. But we didn't want to go through that finalization process until we had a chance to check in with our partners to make sure these are the things that are moving forward. And then our oh-so-talented communication staff who put together this fabulous document, the State Health Assessment, will help us in creating narrative that is more transparent and uh, ideally motivating to folks outside our little world. So the vision is all people in Vermont have a um, fair and just opportunity for healthy, for health, and living in healthy communities, right? So we wanted to make that connection between individual health and the health of the communities. This was the vision that was created by the steering committee and the um, advisory committee, and I jumped over the fact that our steering committee includes our secretary of the Agency of Human Services, of course, Dr. Levine. We also have uh, Martha Maxim, who's the deputy from the uh, the agency, Todd Moore, the director of One Care Vermont, 
Sarah Squirrel, who's now to be the former director of Building Bright Futures and our new commissioner for um, mental health. And then Mercedes Avila, who has been just an outstanding advocate on health equity and our health care system. Um, so those have been our steering committee members, and this has been vetted through them and, and supported. So the outcomes um, you'll see are a little bit different than those five priority areas because what we know is the interrelationship between mental health, substance use, chronic disease, early childhood. If you keep moving back to the why are we seeing these health outcomes, the, the, the drivers are much the same. And that's how we wanted to be able to organize our strategies because there will be many strategies that ideally are going to hit those multiple health outcomes. Rather than going one health outcome by the next, we think if we are creative, we can have a, a much more powerful outcome. So the outcomes are that uh, Vermonters have access to the resources needed for healthy living and healthy aging, that all children achieve optimal child development, Vermonters have lifelong opportunities for oral health, and that Vermonters demonstrate resiliency and mental wellness. So that's where we're aiming for. The overall themes of the strategies that we're going to take are in these three buckets, right? With the fourth one underneath being the foundational piece. And I'm going to speak to that just very quickly. So the first category is about investing in community infrastructure. So as Dr. Levine said, where we live, work, and play, the ways in which our communities are designed and the policies in communities make a tremendous uh, difference in our access to healthy behaviors. You've probably heard our mantra from the health department, which is making the healthy choice the easy choice. And that's recognizing that in order to have choice and make good choices, you have to have good options. So you need to have access to healthy food. You need to have access to transportation. You need to have healthy, healthy building codes, et cetera. And so that's what that sort of that investing in community infrastructure is all about. Um, the strategies that you see listed under there are all evidence-based strategies, um, a number of which have been designated by the Centers for Disease Control as part of their health impact in five years, their high five priority strategies, where they are able to show through uh, their evidence that investing in these has this five-year turnaround. Uh, both on positive health outcomes and return on investment over the lifetime of either the program or the person. So the ROI is not in five years, but the health impact is in five years. So um, you'll recognize some of these. Uh, your staff helped work with us on some of them. Uh, so using payment reforms and regulatory levers to invest in housing, food, and transportation. We've seen some great examples of that already in Vermont. I know you've, you've looked at uh, some of the great housing work that's been uh, supported through our health care system. Expanding subsidies, loans, and grants for weatherization. This is one of those high five. Um, there is proven literature that if you improve um, housing conditions, particularly through weatherization, you have a positive health outcome on multiple levels. But of course, the closest is asthma, one of our primary costly um, health outcomes in chronic diseases. Creating transportation to increase connectivity and reduce isolation. Expanding community water fluoridation and promoting healthy community design. Uh, the three middle ones, so are all part of the high five. Um, and additionally, the strategies, so the, in the middle, that second frame is building individual and community resilience, connection, and belonging. You have heard a lot about this through the uh, uh, adverse child events. Um, you've heard uh, presentations about that, about building flourishing communities. That's sort of, this is that centerpiece where if we have early investments in children and families, they will have the skills the resources to manage their own health to as prevention. And so within here, we have expanding home visiting services, promoting strengthening families, implementing school health and wellness, expanding youth mentors, peer programs and supports, and creating community-based recovery. So a lot of what's here is that intersection between early childhood, substance use, and mental health. Right, that's what's really being addressed in this bucket. Chronic disease is primarily the first one. The middle is uh, a lot about that sort of the more mental health, substance use, early childhood. And then its third one is one that we know you all care about intensely, and that is about increasing access to care and services. Um, and as we know, um, you'll see there are a number of different strategies. One is about integrating primary care 
and health, mental health, um, oral health, and substance use. Right? We threw in oral health, not usually part of the scheme, but we have some really innovative pilots here in Vermont right now uh, where that's happening to great success. Investing in telehealth and telemedicine modalities, including oral health. And then uh, you've heard a lot, I know, about ESPINs, um, the screening, brief intervention, and navigation to services for social determinants and healthy behaviors for all children and all families. The goal here is that we'd have some common criteria and screening tools that could be used in multiple settings and shared across so that we can start digging away at those things that we know are contributing to poorer health outcomes. As I said, the foundational piece here is adopting organizational institutional practices for increasing equity. Um, I would have to say this has been the most challenging part of this process for us as a department in leading this, because uh, we thought we were so great on health equity and we were just going to be able to bring to everyone the great things we're doing, and we are finding just how hard it is. Um, and so we've put it here, and we know this is, might be one of the hardest things for us collectively to do, and yet we know that if we do it, it actually will have the greatest change. So we could, frankly, skip over the middle strategies if we were to really look at our policies and practices that unknowingly reinforce inequity we would actually have greater health outcomes more positive health outcomes so let me just show you the frameworks we're going to use for these strategies give you an example like so what does this all mean so there are two different ways we're going to look at the strategies and the health outcomes. This is the traditional way that we in public health look at things. You might be familiar with our social ecological model, which is a prevention model. And what this basically says that if we want to change a health outcome, we need to be working at multiple levels, the individual relationships, organizations, communities, and policies, that, that you can't focus just one place, right? That you need simultaneous action in all of these ways. And here we're showing you some an example using uh, substance use um, prevention model, right? And so you can read that um, at each layer there are different programs that are targeted to the different different circle, as it were, right? This is how we traditionally think about things in public health. I'm not going to bother reading it. It's a very, very useful tool. One of the things you will hear us say is, uh, and some of you might be familiar with the Thomas Friedman um, pyramid, the health impact pyramid. And basically, they put this into a pyramid this way, but it's opposite, recognizing that working at the individual level actually is has the lowest return on investment, right? Because you're working one to one to one. So if we're thinking about making broad scale societal changes and really changing things over time, the more that we can invest our time and energy in policies and systems and communities, the bigger bang we're going to have for a buck because we're setting in place the conditions for health. And we're not reliant on individual behavior, which, as you know, is very complex, right? So changing behavior is much harder than early adoption, you know, ad uh, adopting behaviors early based on circumstance. The other framework we're going to use, which I think might be more useful um, for the work that you do, is this three bucket strategy. And some of you may be familiar with it. It was developed. Um, by a former director over at the Centers for Disease Control, who now works for the Trust for America's Health, um, Dr. John Auerbach, in collaboration with his friends over at the CMS. And what they were trying to figure out is, when we talk about where's that intersection between public health and healthcare, and we're talking about the range of prevention, and how do we work together, they came up with this schematic. And it's really looking at how do we integrate prevention into the different domains of action with the healthcare system. And so the healthcare system, traditional clinical public health, uh, excuse me, clinical prevention is using you know, the medically uh, evidence-based strategies in the clinical setting or strictly in the healthcare delivery system. In the middle is sort of that innovative uh, place where you bring together the clinical and the community. So for example, our blueprint for health and the community health teams has moved into this middle bucket where they're doing a lot of integration between what's needed for the individual in the medical care setting with what's needed for them in their social and human services. That's an example of what would be in that second bucket. And then the third is where we've traditionally lived in public health, which is these interventions that are community-wide that help the whole population. 
This is the framework that we've been working with OneCare um, and with our partners at Blueprint, where we have actually used this for the existing uh, goals for the state health improvement plan. And we said, okay, so if the goal, for example, is reducing chronic disease, how are we gonna measure that? And how are we gonna know if we're getting where we need to go? And what needs to happen in the healthcare system? What needs to happen in that clinical community setting? And what needs to happen community-wide? And we created what's called prevention change packages um, that shows that line. So you could see we actually took the measures, the current measures for the ACO, and we mapped them using this system. So we could show how we collaborate and how there's, there's actions needed in each of these domains or each of these buckets in order to get to improved health outcomes. And our intent is to do the same thing with the new goals for the state health improvement plan. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give you an example, right? Do you need examples from the previous slide or you're on board with the three buckets? So here's one, I'm actually, got it. Oh. Just in case, so, so the infrastructure to create healthy communities. So that, remember that was the left-hand side of that crazy piece. Is, uh, so the idea is what would we do to create incentives and flexibility in health system financing to fund local upstream efforts and social determinants of health? The healthcare system could be working in buckets two and three in new ways. So one would be uh, to build or purchase housing for the homeless to improve diabetes and asthma management and reduce readmissions into the hospital. We have examples where that's already happening. It's saying this is a best practice that we would like to amplify. If you put an equity perspective on it, you would be saying, well, you would be prioritizing funding for communities identified in the assessment, meaning our LGBTQ population, populations of color, low SES, or disability. Because we know that folks in those categories actually have a harder time getting housing and maintaining their health without housing. Okay, An example of building resilience uh, in bucket one would be screening all families for the social determinants, and I would say, and for health behaviors, we've added that, uh, in medical and early care and in educational systems, and then connecting them to services. It's the ESPINs. Um, bucket two would be expanding the home visiting services for pregnant women and families. And equity, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, the class standards, but the idea is that we, uh, class standards are the cultural, linguistic, appropriate services in healthcare. There was a, a movement of foot probably about 10 or so years ago to try, and they were pretty broad, but basically it's recognizing that culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate care is essential if we want our patients and our population to be able to understand their health and take agency over it. And so the recommendation would be to assure that we are including bias training um, and reducing stigmatization in our healthcare system. And the last example is the access to person-centered care. And, um, and there's opportunities for exploring innovative payment and delivery models. That's what you're doing. Examples would be, is there a way to think about integrating oral health in healthcare settings? How do we do that if we know that that is the number one uh, concern of people in our community right now. Uh, the second would be in this oral health also is being allowed to have oral health services provided in different settings by different providers. So we know that there are some barriers right now in terms of allowable reimbursement rates uh, in our health care system around oral health services and who's allowed to be a provider and in what setting. We'd like to see that expanded. Um, and then again, it would be adopting class standards. So. Those are the big strategies. I'm gonna take you through our plan for finalizing the plan and then I'm happy to have us both answer questions. So remember we got to this point, which is where is their readiness for actions? Those strategies I gave you, we have multiple partners who are ready to work with us. But what we haven't done is we haven't engaged with the communities of people who are actually living with whatever health outcome or disparity or inequity. And, and in order to do this right, we have to go that next level because the more we say for instead of with, whether it's with our communities or whether it's with our patients, it doesn't work, right? People have to engage, be engaged in the decisions and in the, in the work together. So that's our next step. Um, additionally, we need to build the accountability um, and monitoring system. So we will have outcomes, indicators, and strategies. So we're working on a dashboard 
uh, just like we have dashboards for our current state health improvement plan and outcomes, we will have a public facing dashboard that has uh, population health outcomes, meaning indicators that we're going to track with target goals of either five or 10% improvement over um, the next five years. And we're going to identify lead um, agencies or partners who are will so-called own those measures and the work that goes there. Because, for example, there'll be mental health measures that the health department wouldn't own, but our partners over in the Department of Mental Health would own. There may be some things that one care or the a healthcare system would. So we're working on that, and then we're going to work on the developing uh, a shared agenda. So those, uh, and that means really spending some time with the populations. If we continue our equity work, it's really building better relationships um, with some of the folks. We've begun to uh, develop really nice partnerships, for example, with, um, with Pride, the Pride Center and the LGBTQ community. Um, and we have an advise, existing advisory committee with multiple entities um, on disabilities. We don't have such a thing for working with our populations of color. Um, and, and in that is our native um, populations, and our, um, which is something that if we look at our data, we are seeing really uh, much higher stress and poorer outcomes. And so we have a responsibility to, as I said, dig a little deeper with these populations and the work plans that will include components of uh, having them drive some of the strategy implementation. So I think that's where I'm going to close. Um, it was a lot. You will see in in if and when you are curious. <laughs> there are details of every thing that I talked about, and just so that you know, there you'll see there's some really fun little colors there when you get into the details of the strategy. So here's one, like for example, about integrated care, which you probably care. You know, um, you will see. Our goal was to identify strategies that, if we targeted at the right level, would have multiple positive health outcomes, right? And so what you'll see in here are the, the categories that they would hit. So this first one, the integrated care would hit uh, chronic disease, childhood development, oral health, mental health, and substance use. Versus expanding for telehealth for oral health, it's only marked as oral health. Again, it's a way of us further prioritizing to say if we if we are limited in our ability and we need to roll things out um, over time, let's focus on the ones that we know will have the greatest impact on the most health outcomes as opposed to going individual health outcome by health outcome. So hopefully that will make sense as you get to look at it a little more closely. Dr. Levine, what else would you like to add? <clears throat> Just two, <clears throat> two quick comments. First comment is on the uh, the very Let's busy slide. I will go back to the very busy slide. The, um, I'm less harsh on our group than Heidi is. And I would say perhaps one third of these one could have characterized as perhaps public health gobbledygook. But uh, two thirds are pretty explicit. Expand community water fluoridation. Expand home visiting services. I think I understand those pretty well. Uh, and I think the reader even not steeped in the areas we are can understand those. So we do have a little work to do on them, especially the ones on the right, which the more wordy ones, but I think we're close. Second thing is uh, I'm always fond of reminding the group using that colloquial expression, um, a rising tide floats all boats, if that's truly what it is. Um, even though we're trying to really uh, inform you about our equity lens, and pay attention to it, and it is our mantra. And in fact, it's not only Vermont's mantra, but it is catching on across the country in terms of states' attention to their uh, health, health assessments and improvement plans. The fact is, there's nothing in here that won't benefit all Vermonters. And that it needs to be recognized that we're not necessarily looking so, so specifically at a population who requires us to, <clears throat> we want to pay attention to that, but a byproduct is going to be all Vermonters are going to benefit mm -hmm. from the same intervention, the same strategies. Please ask questions. Great. We'll open it up to questions. You want to start, Robin? Sure. Uh, 
thank you. This is this is very interesting, and it's good to get an update on uh, where you are in terms of the state health improvement plan. Um, and I guess I, I wanted to start by saying thank you to you, Dr. Levine, and your staff for working together with our staff on um, how we can intersect the work that you're doing in this area with our work on the health resource allocation plan, because the two need to be uh, interrelated in a very mm -hmm. deep and meaningful way. So uh, I wanted to thank you for that. Um, in terms of questions, I wanted to, I was noticing, and I'm sorry to jump right into the weeds, but mm -hmm. I was noticing in the appendix um, that when you, it, specific to the use of payment reforms and regulatory levers, mm -hmm. um, that you've indicated a priority of social determinants of health, and I wonder if you could just speak to that a little bit and um, maybe how that may also have some interrelationship with substance abuse or mental health in particular. All right. It's slide 20. There, oh, I was there. This one? Yes, the third bullet. If you could just speak a little bit more to why, uh, why yeah. you chose social determinants alone versus uh, right. some of the other priorities. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> And you don't have to answer it now anyway. I oh, was just yeah. curious well, sure about that. So. Uh, we can. I was just deferring. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, part of it because I think that there are opportunities in the work that you are all overseeing um, to, to recognize that um, the, uh, the opportunities that are presented when our healthcare system does invest in the determinants. And so when I mean the, the terms here, remember, were the housing, food, transportation, and economics uh, stability, right? So it's really the first three where, you, where the health system might be investing in. And we've seen some examples where uh, we have seen our healthcare uh, um, actors step in mm -hmm. and provide housing or provide transportation, but there's a question of whether that's a legitimate spend, if I understand. And so really looking at, um, sometimes we uh, create uh, unintentional consequences when we tighten some rules and regulations and are looking very closely at uh, budget allocations and spending that may then preclude us, or not, from investing in the things that we know longer term would make a big difference in reducing healthcare costs. So it's sort of looking at, taking an open eye to looking at that. Um, it also came in, in in a very particular way in that uh, from a, less from a longer term social perspective and more from a, I have an individual client who is suffering mm -hmm. and needs help. Transportation is a tremendously difficult issue for people who can't get to the care that they need, right? So it's whether they can't get to the care and services they need or they can't get to uh, an affordable grocery store, right? And so for each of, of these, there's an opportunity to look at how does it impact the individual and then how does it impact the community? And so the hope is that as we move forward and we are looking at updating and innovating, that we will be looking at both of those levels in because we would contend that um, if we don't invest in these foundational uh, determinants, we'll continue to have a stream of very sick, very costly people coming through our healthcare system. And it will be impossible to get ahead of the healthcare costs and, and controlling those costs. And that in fact it's by investing in some of these things we're able to get there. <clears throat> Just to expand one thing, because um, we kind of think of ourselves in Vermont in this very insular way, and we've got this really special all-payer model deal, and um, if we think a little bit more broadly to all the other states, uh, Alex Azar from HHS, you know, has just come out with commentaries, no firm strategies or policies yet, but commentaries to the effect that it's probably cost effective for Medicaid to fund housing. Mm -hmm. 
It's probably cost effective for Medicaid to expand what it does in transportation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is really revolutionary talk for those that entitlement program. Hasn't spread it to Medicare, but, but just Medicaid at this point in time, I imagine because the states have to put a fair portion of the bill. But at the same time, you don't hear that kind of talk every year from uh, Medicaid. And it makes us almost believe we're on the cusp of something revolutionary, where the recognition is that Medicaid can continue to pay the health care bills, but really, is that what we want to be doing? Maybe we need less of those health care bills, and we could achieve that goal by investing in the way described. Thank you. Um, and then my one other question was, and I know this is not really in the scope of the state health assessment, but I was curious if you had thoughts or in your work, both on the assessment and the plan, in areas that you thought we should be deprioritizing or investments that you think should be shrinking. Because, of course, there's, in order to find funding for one area, sometimes there is a finite amount of money. So, you know. I'm asking you the hard question that the HRAP asks us. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the last state health improvement plan had chronic disease, because it takes years, and had a combination of substance use and mental health, and then the third category was immunization. We don't necessarily believe we need to defund immunization, but we kind of thought we did a good job on that. There's a lot that's happened, and much of it happened through the policy lever. Uh, which is very, very important to recognize. Um, so there needs to be, if you will, less system investment in that arena uh, than what we're already doing now. Um, and we can do other things at other levels of the Vermont Preventive Framework Model to improve on our immunization rates in specific areas like HPV compared to the more basic immunizations. So that's one answer. Yeah, it is really hard. We, you know, and um, all I can say is that getting to this point, we started out when we were doing the state health assessment. You saw that we ended up with five priorities. Mm -hmm. We started with 165 different priorities to get down to five. So, in a sense, by going through that process, we we said everything's important, but only a few things can be priorities. And so I think that's what I would say, you know, really looking at the data, having very clear criteria. Um, those for us were about uh, human impact, social impact, economic impact, opportunity for prevention, and evidence that something's working. You know, so I think, it, I think that's what we have done. And what we haven't said is we're not going to do things, but they are going to be lesser priority, um, which was really hard for some of our folks to accept. Um, very, very hard. But And again, we kept saying the way we're going to do these priorities it was recognize that if we push one lever, it's going to have multiple positive outcomes. And so really just saying that's what we need to do um, ex unless we have such an intense health need that it needs a singular strategy. Thank you. Any other questions? Maureen? Mine was actually somewhat of a follow-up to Robin, but I guess I wanted to ask you specifically, you can give a little more detail about how you think the Green Mountain Care Board can help reduce the disparities and improve equity within subpopulations. Mm -hmm. So in our, you know, health insurance regulation, our hospital budget regulation, hospital regulation specifically, how can we be thinking more carefully about disparities? It's an excellent question. Um, what I don't, let's see, do I have here the greater detail about, I think I do, let's see, if I can give a, all right. These are really broad strategies for, that we're thinking are part of the assessment and part of the, the planning so that we are not unintentionally reinforcing inequities, right? Which is the best place to start, right? Because it's not because somebody is purposely being discriminatory. It's because we have systems that have been in place historically. So um, I think it is, 
this question about bias and racism within our structures and policies? Because you have the tools, right? You're asking about hospital budgeting, you're looking at the ATRAP. So the first is, um, you could use some of what we've been doing in this whole thing was recognizing that if we were going to address equity, we had to look at what data were you looking at? Who's part of the looking at the data? Um, and who's part of the decision making? Um, but really being really clear about that and then charging people not only to show the data but the why, right? So I know, for example, when you are looking at the hospital budget and you're looking across so much data that your hospitals are providing to you, I wonder if there's an opportunity to ask for the why, whether hospitals are being asked or our health system is being asked to what are the driving forces and are you looking at those driving forces? And some of those driving forces are the equity forces. So that's a very broad answer. But I think there's there's a piece there. I can also share with you after the fact um, some of the pieces that we're starting to develop internally at the health department um, in terms of language we're going to put in our contracts to make sure that we're looking at the money that goes out of the department. Is it specifically looking at populations that have been impacted by inequities? Are they engaging people in particular ways? And then also looking at when we look for funding, are we asking for funding using a certain set of language? So we, it's always kind of a, and the easiest is, is always to say, who's affected? And when you ask who's affected and who's part of the decision, you kind of get it at those are the two roots, right? And so the who's affected, if you ask a little deeper about the actual people, you get there. And in my opening comments, we said we weren't going to tell you how to <laughs> do what you do. <laughs> I know. So, um, when we look at what uh, the UVM Medical Center did, you know, a year ago when they uh, had tremendous um, earnings and dedicated a portion of that to housing, um, and I think have shown pretty convincingly that that was a wise investment in terms of, you know, return to emergency department visits, return to hospitalizations in the population that benefited from that. Other populations are, are the other medical centers, hospitals are thinking about uh, activities like Rise Vermont, uh, but not exclusively Rise Vermont, and trying to do something in primary prevention uh, with a portion of their revenues. Um, and uh, I guess I would say this is what it's all about if you really want to go as far upstream as possible, both of those examples I know those are really challenging in, in environments that have so many cost constraints, but these hospitals every three years have to do their community health needs assessment. They have to show that they're actually paying attention to them, and that does require some level of investment. And so in your regulatory function, recognizing that fact is going to be very useful because most of the time uh, the things they want to invest in will probably benefit one of these populations that suffers from inequity much more than the general population at large. Um, yeah, I had just a question on when you talked about selecting your strategies and that you had 54 that were brought to the committee and you were prioritizing those that were the readiness for action. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, are the ones that are ready for action, are those the ones that, you know, that should be? The ones we're going after. I mean, I understand there's resource issues and you want to look at, you know, these are the ones where we're ready, but does that align with where you think we need to prioritize if we, if readiness wasn't the factor? Yeah, yeah, so you'll see that was the first cut, and then the second cut, if you see how the, the details roll up, oh, no, I don't actually have the rankings for you, sorry. So what we did is we looked at what the advisory committee, committee did by uh, readiness, and then we did two more overlays. One was to look at, was there anything that was in the health impact in five years that hadn't been included that we know ought to be included? And we put those in. So okay. fluoridation wasn't readiness. And we said, we can't possibly have a state health improvement plan that includes oral health and not include fluoridation. So there were examples like that where we added those back in because we know that we can have a major impact if we choose to do it. Um, and then a, there were a couple uh, that we added back in because they were the ones where there was that 
lovely color coding that showed that it like the same strategy would impact five different outcomes we added those back in because that again was we know that's where we need to be in addition to where our community partners are ready to go great thanks any other questions Tom so I'm um, uh, cu curious as to even within the agency um, you know your level of uh, kind of scrubbing with this um, um, as, as a background and I'm thinking specifically of the s state's benchmark plan for the QHP population where um, as I mm -hmm. just beginning to get a feel for this but um, where CMS is kind of saying at least that they're going to change mm -hmm. some of the regulations mm -hmm. to give states more fl flexibility in terms of defining the essential benefits uh, in the state plan for example in allowing a state to swab out one benefit on an actuarial basis and, and put another one in uh, that the state feels is, 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 is a better investment. So I'm wondering if, and, and I also kind of think just briefly at the uh, federal level on the income tax form, uh, your federal income tax, you can deduct as long as the doctor prescribes um, a fitness center in terms of a uh, diagnosis of obesity or, um, uh, you know, for, for weight loss. So. You know, the federal government will allow you to deduct that as long as the doctor prescribes it. That might be something that could um, we could look at in the state of Vermont in terms of our uh, benchmark plan uh, as a way to get at a, a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, if, if whether or not you're taking your approach and looking internal to make sure that the agency's um, efforts are fully aligned with, with where you think we should go. Mm -hmm. So we just came from a presentation last week uh, to the agency to introduce everyone to what's going on here, even though many had been partnering with us already and helping develop components of this plan. So just to diffuse the knowledge across the entire agency of human services, I will say that what you've described about the essential benefits, I don't believe has even come close to operationalization at the level of the agency right now. It's not a topic that's coming up a lot because um, I'm not sure how, um, how much certainty there is on the federal level in terms of the direction about that. Um, but I don't think it would provide tremendous challenge to what we've outlined here um, because I don't think, I, I think most of these fit pretty well in some of the prevention kind of benefits that are ordained and I can't imagine those disappearing. Yeah. So I'm hedging a little, but it's because it's not really been a direction that we've gone into in great detail. I mean, I, I, you know, I, just, I look at our benchmark plan, and prevention counseling is is free. It's pre-deduction, pre-copay. Um, but once you get there and your primary care physician says, well, you need to lose some weight, um, there's no help for that. And um, that just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and. Uh, so, you know, and, and I agree with you that I don't think CMS has kind of settled in on these reforms that they're publishing now. I mean, these are in, in their published rules, and, uh, um, and um, Robin and I have had some good discussions about it. She thinks it's just a, possibly um, a situation where you still have to go to CMS on each individual change to, 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 to get approval. But the door's open to cracked, and I'm thinking in terms of obesity and uh, the chronic de disease, rather than just having your primary care physician tell you you got a problem, you know, that they can prescribe something for you um, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that your benefit plan will cover. Mm -hmm. That would be tremendous, and in fact, we you may know we've been successful over the last couple of years in being able to change um, the way that we're able to access on the Medicaid side for tobacco cessation, right? It used to be don't smoke. And now we can actually get our physicians and our primary care can actually code and bill for referral to services and nicotine patches and all of that. And, and we do need that same level of ability on obesity prevention. Um, we've, we've had some conversation um, with our um, representatives in Congress and the Senate who have been really, we have some foodies who are just fabulous, as you know, through the Farm to Plate initiative who are really excited about the idea is food is medicine. 
and some of the experiments that are happening in other places and how that is both great for hunger reduction but also for obesity reduction and is there a way for us to be looking at some systemic reforms around food as medicine as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, I mean, so some hospitals are actually using CSA vouchers. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so, and how do we how do we amplify that and 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 make it so that people know that it's possible and then want to have some uptake on it? So I think that could be an example of a strategy that fits very nicely within the state health improvement plan, um, and that we have been in discussion with folks through the Farm to Plate initiative who would like to have that sort of be their contribution towards our state health improvement plan. Uh, similar to how we've had some conversations with our Agency of Transportation and their network of regional planners uh, who are very interested in this question of how do we make the transportation piece part of the plan. So I think we're going to have some really nice partners and, and as Dr. Levine said, we welcome partnership with you too because where we live, we're not necessarily looking at the CMS regulations and uh, the essential benefits and what those levers are. And so we welcome a partnership with you and your staff uh, to look at where we can think more creatively moving forward. That would be very helpful. Really cool national example right now, though, is in Pennsylvania, and it's being published. Geisinger Medical Center is providing groceries for all of their diabetic patients that are within their own health plan and showing reductions in hemoglobin A1C levels just by being the purchaser for their groceries and kind of ordaining what is a healthy grocery purchase versus what is not. So I fully expected that Jess was going to jump in when you mentioned tobacco and talk about jewels. It didn't happen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we do a lot of talking about jewels. Yeah. That, that's a, a really great example, Robin, where some of our folks have said, haven't we, haven't we been successful with tobacco? Isn't it time to back off a little bit on our investments and our strategies? And lo and behold, here comes Jewel. <laughs> and Jess, it's my little obsession. I have a, I have a middle school now. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. So it's everywhere, and I have a little, like, yeah. I'm willing to be a partner in all things. Fabulous. <laughs> just, just watch the next legislative session. Okay. Good. <laughs> so I don't see any more questions from the board, so I'm going to open it up to the public. And if you could address any comments or questions through the board, and start by standing up and saying your name and the town that you're from. I'm, I'm going to have to apologize. I, I have to be at the Marijuana Commission meeting because it's the final presentation of my committee there. Okay. I'm sure but Heidi can. I Heidi, will stay. Heidi is more than capable. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Levine. Thank you. Very informative. Dale. Yep. Okay. I'm curious. I come from a multiracial family. Uh, let's see. My mom would be Irish. That would be white. Or is it white? And very usually red. Yeah. Exactly. This. I am getting to a point that kind of. But it frustrates me when I see it in my dad. You see white. White can be many things. It can be Irish. It can be many things. My granddaughter is Native American. I've heard her called Spanish. I've heard her called Native American. She lives in California. Out there, you speak Native American, and they think you're speaking Spanish. So. I get kind of confused because I've even heard her say this. She's even texted this to me and said, everybody tells me what I am, but nobody asks me. <laughs> so I'm just trying to explain why I'm asking the question. What is help? So Heidi, what is the definition of uh, person so, of color? So yeah, so we use the census data to pull from as our base, and so it's however that has been defined and re self-reported. 
and, and Dale, I think you're, the, the point that you're hitting on is very relevant to the conversations we're having today because the whole notion of race is pretty much a social construct, right? There, it, it really is, it's just how we have decided at various times throughout history to define people, right? But the unfortunate thing is when we define people in certain categories, we are also uh, pushing them into categories where there are some who have and some who have not, some who are, are advantaged and others who are not. And that changes over time. But what we know historically in the United States is that whoever decided what was a person of color, there has been some systematic discrimination uh, in turn and practices over time. And so we're just pointing out that that's what it's been. We are not trying to create a movement that changes the definition, but we're saying we're working with what has been defined currently by our um, census department. And, yeah. Certainly, go ahead, Dale. So I got one more, I guess, really frustrating. Um, I watched my dad go through this because my dad, his name is Mary, he brought back and he's coming off the reservation. It doesn't show so much to me. I have a knacky, can be a white skin. But you better not say it's white. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dale. Um, other, if you excuse me, Dale, t I have an extra copy here. I want you to take one home with you, okay? Because you can see a little bit more detail about how we use the data categories and how we talk about it. And I think you're hitting on some common uh, themes that we heard through the the folks who were part of our advisory committee. And and our data reflects that. Um, are populations that are so-called non-white populations, and then we break it down in different ways. That we we see differences among those populations, and and certainly our native populations and our biracial, self-reported biracial populations are the ones who are demonstrating um, the highest levels of depression, uh, the lowest levels of mental wellness and physical wellness as well in many categories. So I think you'll be interested. Hey, other members of the public? Yes, Ken. Yes, Ken Lubertop. And um, I want to invoke uh, someone who's no longer with us, but I have to tell you, my old friend, Tom Hogan, would be so ever pleased with the work that you're doing. His enthusiasm would be equal to the fact that if Rutgers beat Ohio State in football, <laughs> that would be an <laughs> Fact, it would have to be a dream. <laughs> and one of the dirty little secrets is that, you know, when we went into the hard times in 2007, 2008, in most departments, the, one of the ways budgets were balanced was by removing most of the indicators yep. and research people. And so it's almost like starting over again. Mm -hmm. But at least there are a lot of, you know, interesting questions. Um, being more pragmatic than some people here, I would also say that occasionally you might want to have some dollar assessment for the proposals that you, or the, the notions you come up with, because ultimately um, that's going to be a challenge to get over. And I assume one of the populations that will be looking at this are people who are elected officials mm -hmm. over in the legislature. Mm -hmm. 
Having said that, what the one, uh, I guess, I'll tell you, we will evolve into a quick question. But whenever we do this, there's such a focus on uh, the, the existing power structure in the healthcare field. You know, commissioners, departments, um, the, the, the quote unquote so called experts. It doesn't mean that they're not experts, but uh, they're so called experts. It would be really interesting to take this project at some point and have more of a consumer patient focus, which would ask the question from the same kind of questions, but a little more definitively to consumers and patients. And um, I think that a lot of information could be gathered, because part of what I think projects like this do is it creates some baseline mm -hmm. information, which is usually missing from all the work that we do. No one knows two years ago what certain you know, costs were, so it's hard to project which direction we're going in. So just, to, you know, kind of the questions that I would pose demographically somehow, and there are ways of doing mm -hmm. this, and it sounds like there is a commitment for certain populations to dig down a little deeper, which I think is good. But just across the board, because part of what I think we're doing is we're moving from one system, a fee-based system, to the ACO model, the one care system. If you don't have some baseline data about consumers, it's hard to know five years from now whether there's really been an improvement. So for example, I would look at the question, or somehow pose the question around costs and trying to figure out for some cross-section consumers how uh, much of a barrier cost is today with, with a particular focus on co pays and deductibles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there'd be a way of getting some of that information and perhaps four or five years from now they could look at it and say, gee, it, it looks like there's really a change that we need to evolve the system on cost. One that I always I'm flabbergasted that it's never really dealt with um, the way it should be in my opinion, is the question of access. And, and these, there are a lot of others I could lay out, but access and waiting times. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to do this quick survey, uh, you could take everybody in this room right now and ask those two questions. The first would be about co-pays and deductibles, and the other would be about it. Waiting, waiting lists, you know, for everybody in this room, because I think you might find some interesting information that would help define where changes should happen for consumers and patients. It's hard to get that information, I believe, from hospitals or uh, insurance companies or whatever for a variety of reasons that I won't get into. So, um, and, and the third issue, I, I, was, I was really impressed. About 30 years ago, I was in a very large gambling casino in Las Vegas. And it was uh, very late at night, and I was checking out. Oh, it was a mental health conference. I'm not making that up. <laughs> it was actually a mental health conference in a casino. It was the Frontier, which I think has been knocked down for a newer casino. But the thing that was impressive to me was I was checking out, and there's mayhem in the lobby with all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. But as I went to check out very late at night, they said in a very nice way, would you take five minutes and fill out this card about your satisfaction for your state? And it seems to me we could do a whole lot of useful work to look at patients and consumers in our state. And again, I can't ask everybody, but there are ways of doing this that would give you a cross-section, because I don't think anybody in this room knows whether there's a high level of dissatisfaction or a low level, I, I don't. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess. And it may depend on geography. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. may, it certainly may depend on particular health care issues. So those are three things. So I guess the question that I throw out is, you know, how much of a consumer focus, a patient mm -hmm. focus, mm -hmm. is in the study, or is so much of, of this really from the institutions that provide both treatment and uh, interventions. Mm -hmm. Should I go and answer? Sure. Okay. Um, a couple of different things. So, because you had a lot to say, which was very provoking. Um, so one is we didn't focus on patients or consumers in that sense because this is not a healthcare study. 
right, is what do we know about the health status of Vermonters and what should we be doing about it? And health access to health care will be one of the strategies because that's what we heard is necessary. But as Dr. Levine set up, we also know it's a small piece of overall health improvement. And so we didn't put an undue look into there because we have other ways in which we do look at patient uh, satisfaction and access to care through our health care system. So that's not really what this one was about. But you will see that if you take a look at the document, and it's all posted online, in our state health assessment, um, when we looked at the CAD, you know, those, those subpopulations that we know have experienced inequities, one of the data points that we tried to look at across the those patients or individuals as well as across the board for Vermonters, we looked at how many have accessed primary care in the last month, who has a primary care provider, and whether or not cost was an issue in terms of their accessing the care that they felt they needed. So we do have that data to see if cost is preventing people from engaging in their health care system. The question about satisfaction with our health care system is beyond this scope, but I know we have very good data that the health department has access to um, that's collected through the hospitals and submitted to our federal agencies and then posted on our hospital report cards. Um, and that is something that we have, um, there are three different sections of the hospital report cards. Some are quality indicators, which include patient satisfaction financial information of the hospitals, and then the results of the community health needs assessments. So that's another way in which we can look at sort of that question of what are people experiencing in terms of their access to and experience with um, the healthcare system. On the broader level, though, this, this question of how do you engage people and will they have a different perspective than we as institutions, 100% agree with you. We And I think that was what we were trying to say that this is why we're, we're going to publish the state health improvement plan as preliminary strategies, recognizing that finalizing the strategies and developing a work plan for implementation is going to require us to have that absolute integration feedback loop with the people who are living in communities. So it's not institution driven, but it's actually driven by the people whose health will be improved if we make the changes. Because only they can talk to the experience of what it is like to try and um, improve health on their own. What's getting in the way for them that's beyond the access to health care? So we really are committed in that next phase to making sure those voices and that experience guides us, because we don't have that from an institutional perspective. Okay, other public comment? Yes, Walter? Sure, so I can answer that very, very quickly. The purpose is that what we know is that the, the frustrations that many Vermonters have with their health care system and being able to access their system and being asked to improve their health, people who are living in the moment of having to deal with that have enough on their plates to have to navigate <coughs> to have the behaviors or have the out access to the medications or their services or the lifestyle that they need to maintain their health. This plan is really trying to make it so that we change the conditions of people's lives and we're looking at opportunities for prevention so that the next set of folks will not have that same level of frustration, that same poor health outcome. So while there's a lot that our healthcare system can do now to help to make improvements for treating people who are already ill, this plan is really about prevention. So we have fewer people who are as ill, as frustrated, um, and who need the higher level of service because we've created communities and we've created systems and policies that support people in getting what they need so they don't experience ill health in the first place. So it's a very different paradigm. It's a very different approach. It complements the work that I think the Green Mountain Care Board is, is used to focusing on and, and has responsibility for in terms of health care delivery. This is not intended to be a health care delivery plan. 
It's really about a prevention plan and what we need to do to change the conditions in our communities and people's lives so they don't need that health care in the same way. <coughs> Agreed. And so what, I don't know if you were here for the presentation, but when we, um, when we spoke to people like yourself um, who were, in, were part of our advisory group, and then we also looked at what the hospitals find when they talk to real human beings, if you ask people what is what is the problem that's getting in the way of being able to be healthy, they'll say lack of healthy food or access to food, transportation, housing, and poverty. That's a driver. So we know that one of the primary determinants or, or drivers of poor health outcome is is an inability to maintain a stable income. And so and the and the systems and structures that that are can um may be contributing to that. So yes, agreed. Okay, other public comment? Yes. I think it, it is the perpetual challenge that you're that you're an asking for, Dale. That in, and because um, we can't plan or implement strong programs without the 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 individual voices of Vermonters, right? And yet, being able to reach people, hear from them, understand them, and translate that into policy and program is really challenging, and particularly because a lot of people. Uh, don't have the time to be as engaged because they're focused on just getting through everyday life, and you know what you know what that is, right? And so, oftentimes, the people that we need to hear from most are the folks who really have no time or the ability to stretch to bring those voices together. So we have to be really creative and, and use multiple types of strategies. Um, and we historically have relied, relied on surveys, and we know now, while they may give us the best quantitative data, they're very, very hard to get responses to now for a variety of reasons. And they only tell us the what. They don't tell us the why, right? We can describe what's happening, but we don't really get that nuance. Well, why is it happening and what could be different? That can only happen in conversation and more of the qualitative research. And frankly, we don't invest in qualitative research to the same extent as we do in the quantitative. So I think we need a sort of combination of approaches. And, and sometimes um, we can get much more meaning from um, a very deliberative, as you sort of said, you know, targeted way of engaging with people in conversation or, or a smaller population than we give credence to. And so I do think we, we, ha we can learn from one another and from that example that you gave on how we can do that better. Um, because otherwise we spend a lot of time and a lot of money and we miss the mark and we can't afford to do that. Okay, other public comment? 
Seeing none, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye.